Welcome, welcome to the Investor Showcase 3.0. I'm Ollie Barrett, and it's my great honor to be your host. Well, firstly, what a pleasure to be back at Here East with the vast majority of our speakers today joining us in person. It feels like normality is starting to return. Well, the Investor Showcase 3.0 is brought to you today, not just by Tech London advocates, but also by global tech advocates as well. And the good news is we've got the European leads with us today because we're being broadcast to a global community of, it must be over 20,000 tech leaders in 20 of the world's fastest growing tech cities and regions around the world. Well, the dedicated advocates among you will have been to our previous Investor Showcase events, and you'll know what to expect. Yes, we've got leading investors sharing their views on the opportunities and the challenges facing tech companies in the year ahead. But our global reach not only is the only difference for this Investor Showcase 3.0, because today is the Tech for Net Zero edition, and of course, we are in the midst of London Climate Action Week. So, investors from around Europe are going to be discussing what growth opportunities they see around green tech, clean tech, sustainability, and the circular economy. And what we really want to do is understand how profit meets purpose, how technology is addressing the single biggest challenge of our lifetimes, climate change can attract record levels of investment. So, we have Europe's biggest investors, largest corporates and academics with us today to discuss and to debate investment trends in this space. We're streaming live across YouTube, Twitter, Clubhouse, and LinkedIn. And we've got a couple of hashtags. One is never enough. It's either uh, the GTA Investor Showcase, hashtag GTA Investor Showcase, or hashtag tech for net zero. And I want to hear from you as we go along with your questions. Well, I know how much advocates like to connect and network, so please do get involved on any channel Ask your questions. I'll try and get as many as possible uh, to our guests here in the studio. If you have to drop out at any point, all of the content will be available on demand. So before we get started, let me just say some big thanks to our sponsors. Well, Here East, our location, of course, is the headline sponsor for the Investor Showcase. Future Energy Ventures is our event sponsor, much more about them later. And thank you as well to Bohurst for their support. Let's get started. Well, to begin proceedings, who else but the founder of the Global Tech Advocates and Tech London Advocates? Yes, of course, it's Russ Shaw himself. And by the way, from the very first GTA network in 2015, can you believe it? That was Tech Nordic Advocates, Russ has created an international grassroots network that spans now every continent. And frankly, very few people have a better understanding of what's happening on the ground in tech hubs around the world. And I know for a fact that no one is better placed to mobilize and harness the private sector and tech community to inspire change. It is a great honor to welcome the inimitable Russ Shaw. Thank you for that warm welcome, Ollie. Great to see you in person. And hello, advocates. Welcome to the Investor Showcase 3.0, the Tech for Net Zero edition. Once again, we're back at Here East for the next iteration of the Investor Showcase, but this time with a difference. We're in the PRG studio at Here East, a new state-of-the-art production studio and another great addition to the Here East campus. Now, let me begin with offering thanks to our partners. Here East is our headline sponsor, and Gavin will shortly be speaking to us about his vision for the future of London's leading tech and innovation campus, as well as the impact report that Here East published just last week. My thanks also go to Future Energy Ventures, our lead event partner, and I'm delighted the fund's co-leads, Inez bergman nulting and Jan Lozek, will be speaking to us today. And many thanks to Bohurst for their support as well. 
Henry Horwood will be giving us an overview of sustainable tech investment across the UK. And a big thank you as well to our annual partners and sponsors who support our program of work. This includes Shoesmiths, Credit Suisse, Lakestar, Hiscox, Russell Reynolds, Globalization Partners, Pennington's Manchester Cooper, and our GTA partners, HP and KPMG. And I'd also like to thank all of our speakers, panel moderators, and of course, Ali, for being our host and compere for proceedings. Now, this is the third time we've held an Investor Showcase event, and each time has been at a moment of significant change for our tech ecosystem. In 2017, our first Investor Showcase was just after the UK government had triggered Article 50, remember that? And to start the process to leave the EU. Then in 2019, the second Investor Showcase came just after the UK confirmed its departure from Europe. And now the context for our third Investor Showcase focuses on the investor perspective on the single biggest challenge facing the world, climate change. And as this is a crisis that transcends borders, so does today's event. Many of the invest investors with us today have a European focus, and we have the leaders of the European networks within Global Tech Advocates ready to share their insights. Hearing the views from investors on this issue is, is critical, I believe, because real change comes when innovation is combined with growth capital. And this investor showcase is the first milestone in our GTA Tech for Net Zero campaign, which we're running all year. As many governments and institutions turn attention to COP26 in Scotland in November, we have considered how we can make a meaningful contribution and decided to focus on three key areas. First, we want to showcase the startups and early stage businesses whose innovations and technologies can be truly transformative and encourage investors and corporates to back them. Next, we want to raise awareness about the role technology can play in helping large institutions reduce their environmental impact. Now, many technologies to combat climate change already exist, yet we, we just need to get better at using them. And technology can also help us measure, track, and implement action to achieve carbon zero. And finally, we want to leverage and mobilize a global community of startups and scale-ups as collectively their actions can make a significant difference. We're also today releasing a Tech for Net Zero startup showcase on the GTA website with nominations from the leaders across the GTA community. And in addition, we've published our list of climate commitments, a series of simple, achievable steps that we're asking our global networks to pledge their support to. Now, given the scale of this challenge and how it impacts all of us globally, this investor showcase is brought to you by both Tech London advocates and global tech advocates. And we now have GTA networks in 20 of the world's fastest growing tech hubs and regions, representing at least 20,000 advocates worldwide. And this campaign represents the first time we've brought all networks together to collaborate on such scale. So thank you again to all of our sponsors, speakers, moderators, and Ali. Now is the time for this global grassroots tech community to show what it can achieve around climate change. Now, I'll be back again at the end of the event for a number of announcements, so I hope you'll stay with us all the way through. And as I always say, we champion, we connect, we support. Thank you, and now back to Ollie. Thank you, Russ. Russ, how does it feel to be back in person? It feels great. <laughs> <laughs> I was starting to forget what this would feel like, but it's great to see you. It's great to see some of our speakers here. And it's so good to reach so many people virtually. But I must say, even that walk to and from the lift, even that little coffee beforehand, we swap ideas, we plot. Well, it's bringing back such memories of all of the great events we've had here at Here East. So nice to be back in a great studio, state yeah. of the art. And um, maybe this is just another step in terms of getting back to true normal events. Yeah, it is. Well, here's to that. And uh, thank you, right. as ever, for your leadership. And I'm going to compare notes with you right at the end, if that's, that's all right. And great. thanks for being here, Ollie. No, it's a joy. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, that's Russ Shaw, the founder of Global Tech Advocates and, of course, the Tech London Advocates. Next, I would like to introduce our host today and the CEO of a campus that really 
encapsulates everything that London needs for a post-pandemic economic recovery. I can tell you firsthand, it is inspiring to see so many within the Here East community back on campus driving growth and innovation. The breadth just gets more and more inspiring every time I come, to be honest. From esports to film and TV, Here East is at the forefront of technology and the creative industries, sectors that will redefine London's economy over the next decade. So, to explain a little bit more about why London needs Here East more than ever, I'm delighted to introduce its CEO, Gavin Poole. Ollie, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Russ, for bringing the Investor Showcase together once again. It's a pleasure to virtually welcome you to Here East, and I'm delighted to be filming today from the state-of-the-art broadcast studio of PRG, one of the newest members to our Here East community. From the outset, we've always fully supported the Investor Showcase series from us and the Tech London Advocates. And the topic for this version of the Investor Showcase, Tech for Net Zero, couldn't be more relevant today. This is a campus that was built with a focus on sustainability, and the environment. This is an urban redevelopment project on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, surrounded by green spaces, the canal and the river, and we've taken great steps to minimize our environmental impact and carbon footprint, evidenced by the many certifications and awards that we've collected along the way. We also recognize that Here East's contribution to the debate around climate change and net zero isn't just about what we do with our bricks and mortar. Here East is a home for the next generation of British success stories, and we are proud to back the emerging sectors that will define the future of our economy. From our tenants developing electric vehicle and micro-mobility solutions, the startups in Plexel working to increase efficiency in public transport, or developing new green energy solutions, and our academic institutions such as the Bartley School of Architecture, with their research programs into net zero developments, our community is laser focused on finding new, sustainable ways of using technology to combat climate change. We have curated a community that can drive change, and we provide a platform to showcase that talent on the world stage. Championing British tech and innovation, showcasing British business to investors, and showing confidence and ambition to overcome major social and economic challenges is exactly what Here East is all about. Russ mentioned that last week we released the latest Here East Impact Report. Our ESG agenda runs throughout the document, but again, we focused on the extraordinary impact our tenants and community have on each other, the local economy, and the talent in the area around us. Given the challenges of the last year and the limits we've had to put on the number of people on campus, we were concerned about what we'd be able to include in this year's report. However, as we were writing it, I was blown away by the picture that emerged. We've seen tenants mobilizing to ensure meals are available for local families in need, companies committing to their young talent to maintain jobs, and academic institutions reaching out into the local community to increase access to education. We've also seen incredible growth. The clusters that we've curated at Here East, from esports and gaming, fitness and lifestyle, to creative and industries and arts, as well as cyber and future mobility, have all been able to adapt, pivot, and expand their operations during the pandemic. As a result, Here East has been able to increase its commitment to social impact projects and initiatives. And the Here East scholarship program that was launched earlier this year to support local young people through their higher education journey being just one example of what we're able to achieve. The result is mutually beneficial, collaborative community that shows just how significant a campus like Here East is for the local economy and the people that surround us. And we're only just getting started. We're developing bold and ambitious plans to increase the growth and impact of Here East. We want to attract more fast growth, innovative businesses to the campus, and we want to increase our positive impact on the local community and the London economy. Here East is now a multi-award winning campus, recognized as setting a new standard for what urban redevelopment and Olympic regeneration can do for a city, for a business, and for the local community. Our innovation ecosystem, Plexel, is now operating in three cities across the country, delivering innovation programs in the National Cybersecurity Center in Cheltenham, 
in Manchester, as well as here in London. At the same time, we are increasing our collaboration with innovation centers around the world and supporting government initiatives to assist other nations grow their technology. And we are planning some major developments here too that I hope to be able to tell you more about in the coming future. So why is an innovation campus like Here East important when London has been experiencing such challenges over the last year? It's important because we want to pioneer the evolution of a city whose successes depend on its potential for reinvention. The future of London won't be defined by the city. It won't be defined by Brexit or the pandemic. It will be defined by the ambitious entrepreneurs and innovators in emerging sectors, by a new geography of business clusters close to young talent, and by the collision of technology, of culture, creativity, and digital. Here East is integral to that journey, and we will work with entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors joining us today to create a city and a society that is relentlessly focused on growth, on innovation, and on the environment, whilst ensuring all parts of our society are included. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to Russ and Ollie for kicking us off, and I hope all of you enjoy this investor showcase. Well, thanks to you, Gavin. Uh, it's so good to see you. Can I ask you a quick question about this amazing campus? Um, you've got such a variety of organizations. Do they tend to keep themselves to themselves, the large and the small? No, that's the fun about this place, is the collaboration and the integration. They all want to get to know one another. They all want to come together. That's why the last 15 months has been slightly a little bit of tension, because what we want to do is mix. Yeah. Uh, that's starting to see, you can see today outside. Yeah. Uh, so everybody wants to really understand, and most of the work that we do is bringing people together so they get to experience one another. Yeah, you're a, you're a connector in that sense. And, and final question, particularly for our international guests tuning in, just remind us on the map, where it's a famous location for a start. Right. So here East is on the Olympic Park. It's in East London. Yeah. Uh, it's in Hackney. Yeah. Uh, and it's the place where London 2012 took place. The buildings are the TV centre, the studios and the broadcast capability, which actually put the TV into your homes around the world. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, we've come full circle. We're back broadcasting. But for now, Chief Executive here is Gavin Poole. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, I should say thank you for hosting us as well. Well, lots to come in this Investor Showcase 3.0. But before we welcome our first panel, we have got a message from Andrew Griffin, uh, or rather Andrew Griffith, the MP for Arundel and the South Downs, who is also the UK net, biz, uh, net I think it's net zero business champion. Thank you, Ollie, for the introduction, and thank you to Global Tech Advocates and zero, Tech London zero, Advocates for inviting me to speak here today at Investor Showcase 3.0. It's always exciting when investors come together to hear about the incredible opportunities that the net zero transition offers. I'm joining you just a few weeks after the UK hosted the successful G7 Summit in Cornwall, and as we prefer, prepare to welcome the leaders of the entire planet to the UN Climate Summit, which is taking place in just 18 weeks' time now. It's no exaggeration just that this year we have a historic opportunity to make real and lasting change happen. The UK government is leaning in, committing to a world-leading target which would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a staggering 78% by 2035 compared to 1990 levels. Action from global leaders is an imperative. But let's make no mistake that when the climate summit is over, they've taken all their pictures, put the flags and chairs away. It is technology, innovation, entrepreneurship and private capital that's going to save us. For you see more clearly than most that we're on the threshold of a new climate tech revolution. It's a revolution that's going to see not only save our planet, but one that will see whole new sectors of the global economy come into existence. No aspect of human life will be untouched. Thousands of billion and trillion pound companies will be created, and many of those today will fade away. We'll see entirely new forms of clean energy, such as fusion, sitting alongside those that, while they may be small today, they may become dominant energy sources of the future. Transportation systems will be reinvented with zero carbon aviation, autonomous, hydrogen powered ships, and radically different urban transport solutions. 
proper circular economies will be established in everything from food to clothing to green glass, steel and aluminium. And all using natively smart networks, ubiquitous connectivity and data that's unlocked by the power of quantum generation computing. Every day, I encounter the innovators building or investing in the future. Many of you are here today. But to conclude, friends, we've got a big task, but an even bigger opportunity. As technologists, we should embrace revolutions. They disrupt the status quo and create opportunities for change, to tear down the old and to establish a whole new order. The entire span of human history teaches us that the future we can create can be better, healthier, cleaner, and more sustainable than what went before. Thanks very much for everything you're doing. Do more if you can. And I look forward to collaborating and hearing your stories of success in the coming weeks and months ahead. Well, my thanks to Andrew Griffith, MP. Do more if you can. Well, challenge accepted, Andrew. Uh, yes, we can will be our response to that here at Global Tech Advocates. If you're just joining us, this is the Investor Showcase 3.0. And for our very first panel, I'm very happy to say we have some of the biggest investors in Europe here to discuss the growth opportunity for technology addressing climate change. Of course, we know it's the hot topic for government. We've just heard that and corporates but how is the VC community backing tech for net zero? And what are our investors looking for in terms of the startups and scale-ups that can shift the needle on climate change? So let me tell you who's here on our panel. Well, first and foremost, here in person, Bindikaria, how lovely to see you. Nice to be here in person. Live and in 3D. It's I great. I can see you, Ollie. It's real. To, uh, You're not a hologram. It's awesome. It's amazing. You probably recognize <laughs> Bindi anyway. She's one of the most recognizable and respected figures in London tech. Uh, she's an innovation expert, a campaigner, an advocate for women in tech, and now a venture partner at Draper Esprit. Absolutely. Congratulations. You've had an amazing series of roles. This is good. Well, thank you. It's just wonderful to be here amongst uh, people like myself who love, adore, tech and innovation yeah. and it's great to see that the next wave is moving in this direction well i want to well. hear what you're particularly looking yeah. for in this new role yeah. uh, our second guest who joins us virtually uh, needs very little introduction actually Anne glover she's one of the most prominent investors in the uk and beyond she founded amadeus capital in 1997 hello Anne. how are you very well very well thank Far you so away. much Wish I was with you well, it's great of you to join us. Thank you. Um, let me say as well, joining us also virtually, Ines Bergman-Nolting is a managing partner at Future Energy Ventures. Now, this is very interesting. This is a Berlin-based VC platform for E.ON, which is seeking to shape the future energy landscape. Welcome, Ines. How are you? Now, I've not got your voice there, Ines, so maybe our viewer won't. So let's try one more time. Can you hear me, Ines? Yeah, we'll move on. I know that Thanks voices from Berlin me. have been noticeably quieter today, but I won't mention that. Don't you worry about it. Next <laughs> up, we've got Melanie Hayes, who is managing partner at Bethnal Green Ventures, which is arguably the most prominent tech for good VC in London. Hello. Hello, Melanie. Hey, Ollie, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm getting you loud and clear. Um, and by no means least, Oliver Richards is a partner at MMC Ventures, which has backed some of the UK's most successful tech partners and is focusing heavily on sustainability. Hello, Oliver, how are you? Hi, Ollie. Very, very pleased to be here. No, well, thank you all for joining me. Now, I reckon our viewers are going to want to know a few things. They're going to want to know what you're already invested in in this space, and particularly what you're looking for, types of business, traits, and so on. Give us a sense of that sweet spot. But also, we want to know um, what, what's the secret to really shifting the needle on all this as well. So um, in no particular order, Anne, when it comes to Tech for Net Zero, just remind us what your current interest is and what you're on the hunt for. We are very interested in new battery technology. Um, the issue is all the renewables are 
well understood, but they're intermittent, and therefore anything that is in, that in, encourages better storage. Um, we're also looking for more efficient processing power. So we're doing a lot in the world of quantum computing and in the world of AI, which is just making the use of commute compute power more effective. Yeah. But we look well beyond net zero. We're looking at sustainability as well. And so we have very interesting material fields in uh, replacements for plastics, bioplastics. Yeah. A company called, for example, Zampla. Yeah. So we're not just looking at net zero. No, really important to cast that sort of wider net, particularly around uh, the circular economy and so on. And, and just briefly remind us, is that still wearing your Amadeus hat or is there a separate investor that you have in mind as you speak? No, we see tech writ. We, 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 technology basically supports all of those activities yeah. uh, and verticals. Quite right. Um, so we're... It's it's absolutely still in the mainstream of what we do. Notice now, very briefly, uh, let's go around. Oliver, MMC, what are you in, and what are you looking for? We are um, very focused on the circular economy. Actually, uh, we're in um, a lot of businesses where they're leveraging emerging technologies such as AI, blockchain, and others for for good. You know, we're a research-led fund. We became a B Corp ourselves. And you know, we have very much a commercial lens through every investment we make, but we're very focused on you know, ESG and sustainability in yep. kind of every single investment we make. Yep. And I think actually the the really exciting thing about this sector is that we believe deeply that the the success stories of the future will be sustainable first, and I right. think that will cut across all sectors. No so, good. You know, and Oliver, tell me your, your sweet there. spot for investing. How early do you dare to be? We can go super early, actually. We have the London Mayor as an LP for a, for a seed fund we run, which is um, can go pre-seed, so it can yeah. go for you know, a couple of couple of people with PowerPoint through to our sweet spot, which is Series A, which is you know, some traction, looking to raise sort of five to ten million pounds, and then we have some later stage pools of capital as well that continues to support businesses at scale. So, so we're, we're focused super early, actually, in, in in this space in particular, because uh, you know a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs are coming out today and. and it's, it's a good time to, to be starting a business with a, with a kind of sustainable focus. Yeah, good to hear. Now, Ines, I know you're joining us now. Just remind us, before we um, ask what you're into, Future Energy Ventures, a platform, does that mean you've got the money? You're working with other people's money? Just, just help us imagine it. So um, today, Future Energy Ventures is the venture capital platform um, of E.ON, as you said. Um, E.ON is the largest operator of energy networks and infrastructure in Europe. So um, plus that a provider of innovative customer solutions to 50 um, million end customers. Um, so um, we're working mostly for, for E.ON. Nevertheless, we're bringing together on our platform of venture um, for future energy ventures, we're bringing together startups. We're bringing together um, our um, main LP, E.ON, and we're bringing together other partners um, and um, people from our ecosystems. That's why we believe um, we're more than just um, a pure uh, CVC unit. Got it. And Ines, will you invest in companies around the world or do you have a very specific geographic focus? So I think you can um, call it almost around the world. Uh, we believe in, in global reach. We have ah. three um, major areas uh, we're active in. So um, that is uh, Europe and we are located in Germany, uh, but we're also actively um, investing in the US uh, where we also have a presence the same as uh, in Israel. And yeah. um, from those regions, our um, portfolio is mostly made up. Got it. No, thank you, Ines. Um, now, Melanie, Bethnal Green Ventures, you've been banging the drum for tech for good um, uh, for, for, you know, 10 years or more. You know, uh, we're all a bit late to the party, really. But just remind us, you've been through a deal yourself this week, haven't you? Yeah. 
Congratulations. Yeah, yeah it's been it's been a busy week and, a, and an exciting one. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we definitely have been uh, banging the drum for a while, but it's, it's lovely to have lots more people joining the party. I think I think that's only a good thing uh, for uh, sustainability and, and climate tech startups. Um, uh, just to, as a, a quick overview of, of where we invest and when. So we are early stage investors. We invest from startup through uh, pre-seed and seed. Um, we are typically the first money into the Tech for Good Ventures that we back, um, definitely the first institutional money for the vast majority of them. Uh, and we uh, are really looking at a whole range of um, uh, businesses that fall within our sustainable planet investment theme. So uh, looking at things around resource efficiency, uh, making uh, uh, energy, uh, re renewable, clean energy abundant and affordable. Yeah. Um, we look at things around the circular economy, responsible consumption, for example, uh, as well as reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions particularly in cities and urban centers where where yeah. people live yeah very helpful and just remind us briefly melanie of the deal you did this week uh, this week, uh, we merged with uh, a pensions asset manager called Connected Asset Management. Uh, we're excited to bring uh, pension savers money to Tech for Good, uh, investing in the kinds of businesses that are aligned with the values of, of, of most people, but also hopefully are providing solutions to the things that will be, uh, you know, prominent and pertinent uh, by the time they retire. Brilliant. No, thank you. Congratulations uh, to you and the team. Uh, well, Tech for Good meets uh, pension funds. That's an unlikely alliance, Bindi, isn't it? I think it makes sense, actually. Pension funds are looking at ESG as a whole, and they need to bring the right kind of specialists in. So very happy to hear about uh, Bethnal Green Ventures it and, totally, and the merger. It, it so totally does Well done, sense. Melanie and team. No, congratulations. <laughs> now, Bindi, with your latest app, Draper Esprit, what are you searching for, and have you started to make some investments already? So I, I probably would like to talk with several hats. Mm. So first of all, with the Draper Esprit hat, we're coming, right, we, we, we tend here. to invest a bit later down the road, um, a little bit later down the line. So company, uh, people like MMC or Bethnal Green or Amadeus will invest at a much earlier stage, but we will come in at a bigger Series A, Series B and growth. So, you know, we're, we're waiting to see some of these great ones come down the line or we'll invest, you know, in ones that we really think are uh, for the future. So Servest is one we recently announced uh -huh. um, earlier this year. I think the other thing is we have a fund of funds at Draper. And so that fund of funds, we do LP in smaller funds, mm -hmm. um, you know, the earlier stage emerging funds. So I think looking at uh, the pipeline we have, there's a lot of funds coming up the pipe that are emerging and that someone like a Draper Esprit can put money into. Then with the other hats I wear, because I'm kind of getting a really great overall view of the problem and yeah. what's going into it. Um, I've just recently joined the investment committee of a super, super early stage uh, talent accelerator. So it's a bit like the entrepreneur first of climate. Uh -huh. uh, and it's called Carbon 13, run by a professor from, of entrepreneurship in Cambridge and a couple of entrepreneurs. Yes. So the program has begun. They've got about, uh, so don't quote me, but about 30 people in there. And uh, we will be looking at the new companies that are formed in mid-July yeah. and deciding what money will get invested. So super, super early, pre-company formation. And then the final bucket I'm seeing a lot of is with my hat where I'm on the board of European Innovation Council, mm -hmm. and that's a big deep tech innovation fund. And one of the calls we did last year was um, one of the calls we did last year was based on green tech and climate tech to really be in line with the European green and climate agenda. Yeah. So I'm seeing government, I'm seeing super early stage, I'm seeing funds like my peers on the panel, yeah. and I'm seeing funds like Draper all putting money into it. So it, yeah. it is the next wave of investment for sure. So, so what I'm trying to get my head around just in this early stage of our broadcast today, and Anne Glover, perhaps I'll ask you this, there's so much buzz around this in the run up to COP26. So what are we seeing here? Are we really seeing a serious growth sector for tech? Or is that buzz, frankly, going to fade away and investors' eyes will roam elsewhere? Sorry, Ali, I'm, I, miss, I couldn't quite hear you there. No, well, I'll say it again. Have you got me now, Anne? Are you, am I clear to you? Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. We've, we've got a bit of interference from the sound center. No? That's okay. I'm just trying to understand from your perspective, so much buzz around this area. Um, to what extent is this really a serious area for tech investment? Or 
dare I say, could it even be a fad? I mean, for goodness sake, the problem to solve isn't a fad, but maybe the investor interest is. No, oh, the yeah, investor God, interest is not a fad. Um, every single vertical of every kind needs to pay attention to the energy savings and, but as, as I say, also the biodiversity, not just the, the energy uh, climate uh, problem. And I think that as part of the ESG agenda that is very fundamental now to most of the responsible investing um, is I think that that uh, will happily um, uh, keep people's focus. I think the challenge is that it really takes very big money to address these problems. And so much of it is in infrastructure as well as in sort of tech development. So the tech community can really deliver a lot of value, but we need big projects uh, to, 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 be, um, to be included. Got it. So we'll come back to you, and Bindi, uh, on this same question. So I think there's an observation that we're seeing a lot of US VCs putting money into the problem. We're seeing special vehicles pop up. We're seeing the Sequoias, the benchmarks, et cetera. Uh, setting up climate practices, and there are quite a few U.S. funds that are uh, building that. Europe, it's starting. So mm. you're starting to see some specific funds. You're starting to see climate change uh, being talked about, you know, more openly. I mean, look at what this session is about uh. today. But it's definitely a lot less than U.S., but it's coming. It okay. is absolutely coming. So, so, so just to be clear, your view, Bindi Kari, is that the British or the European VCs are behind their U.S. counterparts? Well, we're, we're just, there's more there than there are here. That's, I don't, wouldn't say behind. Okay. I would say Europe definitely and UK are very uh, well versed in delivering the agenda. I just think there's fewer funds here. Yeah. But I think that will change very quickly. Got it. Yeah. Now, Oliver from MNC, um, you're a B corporation yourselves. Um, how do the entrepreneurs that you're meeting set out to navigate this path between profit and purpose? Maybe I've set it up using the wrong analogy, but how do you see this? I can see Anne Glover shaking her head already. We'll come back to you, Anne. Oliver. Well, I think it's, I think it's broader than just thinking about businesses that tackle sustainability or, or are focused on I mean, net zero. I think all businesses have an agenda around sustainability. And so I think, you know, as, as you rightly point out, we're a venture capital fund, but becoming a B Corp demonstrates our commitment to a broader sustainable future. Uh, but we, we wouldn't class ourselves as a sustainable only investor. We wouldn't class ourselves as you know, effectively a net zero dedicated business. We're just part of a broader movement, which is happening you know, uh, in, in all areas of, of, of startup land, if you like, where you know, being sustainable is a, is a very core part of, of a lot of like, purpose driven founders, irrespective of the sector. Yeah. And Melanie, isn't the challenge with so many of the uh, members of the VC community that they're just too impatient? They want their money out too quickly and they need to wait. Um, I think it's certainly a challenge um, in terms of uh, investing um, in technologies that are unproven in um, industries which are still very much uh, at the start of, of, of change and, and of embracing new ways of doing things in order to reduce uh, their, their carbon emissions, for example, to use resources more efficiently. Um, but I think um, the, the venture capital <laughs> is used to waiting. It, 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 you know, a typical fund is, is 10 years, 10 plus two years. Um, I don't think 12 years is, is, is an is an unfeasible amount of time for a company to go from startup to a significant uh, business of scale that is really starting to address some of these these challenges. I don't think we will necessarily have solved them all in the lifetime of any one particular fund, um, but I think there will be um, significant progress made in yeah. those kind of timescales. Okay, now I do want you to come back on this, Anne, before I hear from Innes about what they are backing. But Anne, th th this point on profit and purpose, wh wh where do you stand? You've been backing one of the world-changing companies of our era at Arm. Yes, I mean, I personally, I uh, think that purpose uh, is always been at the heart of creating great companies. 
Um, in other words, if you don't have a clear vision and a long-term value story, and I mean value for society um, beyond just the shareholders, it's very unlikely that you're capable of building yeah. a great company and a yeah. large company. Okay. So I, I've never seen this as a, as a conflict, personally. No. Got it. No, and thank you. Um, that's Anne Glover speaking from Amadeus. Now, Ines, can I turn to you just to give us the bird's eye view again in terms of what technologies you're seeing emerging that are particularly interesting to you as you get out your checkbook? Mm -hmm. What do you look for? What are you seeing? Yeah. So um, at Future Energy Ventures, we have three uh, investment areas we're looking at. This is future energy, future cities, and future technologies. Uh, and within these areas, we sort of see certain C themes and technologies in particular as driving. So within the energy um, segment, um, the trend um, continues um, for distributed generation and uh, storage. Um, another topic that's clearly becoming a priority for us is uh, on green gas and uh, hydrogen. Um, then moreover, um, we're looking into how we can make our um, distribution infrastructure, in particular uh, energy grids, uh, more intelligent. And this is um, now uh, on the edge to f taking off more. And then another topic within the energy segment, um, I would call it uh, carbon capture 2.0, uh, oh, yeah. but the topic is coming back uh, on, on the horizon uh, yeah. for us. And then yeah. within our uh, vertical of uh, cities, uh, electric mobility, I think, and charging, I think not to mention in that round is definitely uh, staying um, important within connected urban infrastructures. Uh, we're looking at technologies that enable um, such an infrastructure and then another um, area that it's becoming um, more important and growing um, in our view is the, the topic of climate uh, intelligence or anything um, for, for managing greenhouse gases or and climate risk analysis. Yeah, got it. So, so we're back there to the very sort of tech uh, solutions, I suppose. That's very helpful. Now, I've got some specific questions coming through from you, our audience members. So thank you for sending them. Bindi, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you think that US funding increases in net zero solutions have been encouraged by the recent change in US government, or has this been a longer term trend? Oh, that's a... A question and a half. I, I don't know the answer to that one. I think what I would say is that more and more companies are being driven and encouraged to share their insights and data and reporting around climate and climate change. Yeah. And I think therefore you're seeing an evolution of software and data uh, companies that are rising up as a result. And a VC being a smart VC is going to look at the wave. So I yeah. think this is a wave, and the VCs are pulling up on the right. wave. Right, so, so we've got a panel coming up. I won't up. be political about so, that. So, well, that's very <laughs> diplomatic. I can see you in the ambassador's <laughs> chair there. Um, uh, Oliver, we're going to have a whole panel on investment. Um, uh, how early is too early to start measuring your impact in the world? Frankly, isn't that just distracting these entrepreneurs who should just be getting on with solving the problem? Well, I, th I, think, I think it's a great question. I think we need metrics to be able to demonstrate we're making progress. I think we should. We shouldn't focus too much on, on forcing entrepreneurs to give us too much data. I totally agree. Um, but I think, nonetheless, you know, as an industry, we believe venture is a force for good. We do create yeah. you know, vast amounts of jobs and tax and economic yeah. growth. And I think we should be focused as much as we can on, on the sustainable aspects of all of that as well. Got it. So, we've, so we've got a lot. A few, few little data requests is there. Yeah, okay, noted, thank you. And um, we've got a lot of questions coming through. A specific one, Anne, it's going to take you back to quantum computing. Anne, do you think that quantum computing will solve the problem of intense energy usage that we currently face with existing, emerging technologies like data centers and blockchain? Are you going to give us some hope on that? Not initially, no. Not initially, uh, because the, the approaches to quantum often involve very low temperatures and that's uh, energy absorbing uh, um, in and of itself. What it will allow us to do is solve problems that we've never been able to address before, yeah. um, such as molecular modeling, even, even weather um, patterns. I mean, it's a very, very complex problem. I think there are other ways uh, that we will improve the data center problem. Which 
is um, essentially, um, you know, use the chips like the graph core chip, both being in uh, yeah. Amadeus or uh, Draper and Amadeus. Right, got it. No, thank you. Now, I've got a very Sorry, quick question. Um, we're going to ask you to be uh, sort of super brief because we've got a number of more uh, questions coming through. Um, I want to understand the role of government or governments in all of this. So, Melanie, let me put you on the spot. What is the single biggest thing that a government can do to unlock this whole process where great capital meets great companies? What are you demanding? And I'm going to ask you each to be very pithy on this question, please. Melanie. Um, I would like to see enhanced uh, tax breaks for individual investors, particularly angels willing to take risks uh, on businesses that are tackling the biggest problems that face us as a planet. So uh, what, what more can you do with SEIS and EIS, for example, to really help um, more startups start in this space? Brilliant. So SEIS, uh, a much lauded invention, if you like, on policy uh, terms. Bindi, add to our list. Uh, I think putting money into the, the deep tech problems, so potentially quantum and other of the other deepest of tech problems, and that's because as investors we like to come in a bit later before the formulation. So at university level and at research level, at the point it's getting commercialized. So put more money into that space. So tax, taxpayers' money on the riskiest of, inv of investments. Well, I think this is going to help us all. OK. So, yeah. And grants, loans, or investing for equity? Uh, I've seen all three, personally. Mm -hmm. um, I think investing for equity means you might get a return, even if it's 1x. So uh -huh. you're recycling the money that comes in uh, from the government. But I think the policy stuff that Melanie talked about as well is very, very important. Got it. So. Um, Oliver, one-to-one um, -one with number 10, what are you asking for? I think, I think I'm, I'm aligned with what's already been said. I think the, the smart cities, you know, electric, electrification of vehicles, pushing, pushing the boundaries of emerging technologies and adoption of emerging technologies. I mean, often public, public sector organizations can be early adopters of some of these new technologies, yeah, which, totally. which is a fantastic way to kickstart yeah. a startup. Well, that comes back to setting bolder deadlines, doesn't it? We just look at these uh, diesel cars, gone. So you'd like to see tougher targets. What, have you got an example of that, Oliver? Well, I think the cars is a great example. We're actually investing at the moment in a, in a, in a software business that enables non-Teslas to be like Teslas. And you know, there's, a, there's a whole raft of in, uh, battery innovation and, and software innovation in, 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 in around electrification. Got it. I mean, we're seeing flying cars being back in Lilium and you know, fantastic European success story. There's, there's a bunch of examples where I think, yeah, pushing pushing targets, being a bit more aggressive with stuff that we know is damaging the environment yes. at a policy level. Got it. Now, also, the klaxon goes off for the first mention of flying cars, and you win a special prize, Oliver. So thank you uh, for that. Innes, what are the entrepreneurs you speak to asking their governments to do to support their quests? Yeah, I think um, it has been already mentioned in the sense that, uh, in particular, founding ground uh, research, there we see a, a definitely a gap. And in particular, when we're talking uh, in the climate uh, tech and clean tech space um, for more um, hardware heavy business models, um, that there is, um, whereas there's a bigger financing need, that there are also the resources yeah. available. Uh, for financing um, these business models and getting them um, up the ground. So that's a particular request we see in, uh, in our area and where we observe uh, a clear uh, gap still these days. Got it. No, thank you, Ines. I guess my, my final question to you all really is, I mean, if we look at what Bohurst are covering and Henry Warwood, their head of research, will speak later, we're seeing some of the most successful companies spinning out of universities. So my final question is about collaboration across the ecosystem. This is our chance to shine a spotlight on a type of collaboration we need to see not just a little bit more of, but much more of. Anne Glover, what's your rallying call to us today? I think it's uh, large companies working with small ones. It's being uh, letting the small, the small companies find intelligent large customers. Uh, and that could be government. Uh, yeah. But it's also, you know, the large energy producers and yeah. the um, uh, infrastructure providers. Yeah. That's really, like really important. Coverage. 
really important point about government as customer, putting down those big contracts yeah. and big bets. Uh, Melanie, very briefly, and then I'll go up to Innes. Um, I think I would say around collaboration, I would like to see far more uh, people from, I guess, sort of um, incumbents in the energy sector, um, in, the, in the computing sector, really engaging with startups and disruptors in this space. So yeah. going to more meetups, joining Slack channels, joining uh, forums and really engaging with um, all kinds of interesting um, uh, ideas and challenges that are being discussed and debated in those forums. Because I think actually that's where we'll see some really creative solutions and collaborations coming yes. out rather than necessarily through formal innovation programs. Yeah. It's a brilliant observation. Innes, you're showing how a huge corporate can engage with the next generation of entrepreneurs. What collaboration do you want to see? So um, you mean from the startup uh, angle? Is that what your question is going at? It, it, it could be any collaboration you would like to see more of as we unlock and solve these huge problems. What's missing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, when I look um, from from the startup perspective, um, I see um, two things that that might be uh, still still missing. I think they um, need an, at an early level. Um, I think even more corporates uh, who give uh, out contracts um, to to those companies in those uh, areas to to scale fast. And the um, second uh, element is certainly, um, and I think it's an increasing in the climate tech and the clean tech space recently, but also uh, corporates um, who are willing um, to, to put the down their money and actually um, um, become active in, in trade sales and take over um, these companies. Interesting. A controversial uh, so offer extra. No, th th interesting exit opportunities. I think the last point, I think what we see rising is the um, amount of capital and funding available in the space. I think there we have made uh, a huge step forward. Yes. Uh, nevertheless, those elements would be aspects I see missing. In Great. Cooperation. Thank you, Ennis. That's very clear. Uh, Oliver, a final thought on collaboration and we'll finish with Bindi. I think I think R&D uh, support is the is the key around new technologies. Um, so I, I I'm all up for um, you know innovation collaboration around new new R and D and technology investment, um, both from from corporates yeah. encouraging corporates to do more and encouraging government. Got it. No, thank you, Binda. You know this ecosystem better than probably anyone I know. What do we need to double down on? I, I think actually um, all of us learning to speak each other's language. And it, because I do work across the whole value chain, so from LP through to VC, through to corporate, through to startup, through to government, through to university research and innovation, I've spent time in all of those areas. We don't speak the same language. Right. We think differently. We don't necessarily have the same goals. So I think if we really start to understand and learn from each other across the whole value chain, that's a step in the right direction. I think a part of that is probably yeah. this point around inclusivity, around getting comfortable with asking what we might have thought of stupid questions? Well, it depends, right? So LPs, um, you know, the, is that part of their agenda? And therefore, are they going to give the money to the VC funds that deliver on that agenda? And then are the VCs going to pass it on to the founders that they will believe on deliver on that? And then at the same time, governments and universities are... Is government buying from the founders? Is government putting money as an LP? Is government, you know, working with universities yes. and researchers to commercialize that innovation and use policy to help drive all of that? Yeah. I think collaboratively is really the only way we can really do it. But we need to understand each other. And I genuinely don't think we're there quite yet. Right. Well, onwards with that in mind. Thank you, Bindi Karia. And indeed, uh, to all of our panel uh, joining us from around the UK and indeed across Europe. Thank you very much, one and all. And thank you to you uh, for sending in your questions. We had more than we uh, could fit in in that. Now, uh, it gives me great pleasure to begin to introduce Adrienne Everett for a fireside chat about a very, very important topic, diversity and inclusion in sustainability. Let me tell you something about Adrienne. Adrienne is an investor. She's an advisor at CLIM8, C-L-I-M number eight, which backs clean energy and green sustainable companies. Adrienne, over to you.
such an honor to be a part of this incredible event um, featuring investors and entrepreneurs from all across Europe. We're so pleased to be having a very open conversation around diversity and inclusion in the sustainable technology startup ecosystem. Um, this is a topic that is extremely close to the hearts of Tara and I. Um, we plan mm -hmm. to cover a lot of ground. I don't think I'm live. I think it might be silent. I think Tara and I might be swapped. <laughs> Should I start over? <clears throat> awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that amazing I don't hear introduction. Adrian. I don't think Tara can hear me. I don't hear Adrian. Can you hear me now, Tara? I think we're having a little bit of technical issues on our side. Okay, well, we're just going to make sure everyone's tech is back up and running. Why don't I just tell you just in a minute or so uh, what else we've got coming up. We'll be hearing about micro-mobility, so e-scooters, bikes, maybe even e-skateboards. And uh, I'll hear firsthand from Gavin Poole about how a trial down here at Hare East went and what comes next. Also, Emily Brook, founder of Beryl, those clever laser lights will be joining us as well. Um, we'll also go inside the deal radar himself. Henry Warwood from Bowhurst will tell us what he sees and what's cooking. Uh, we have got particular conversations taking place around measurement. So Flavilla Fong Gang will be talking us through what's worth measuring. Not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything uh, that can be counted uh, counts, as Einstein famously said. Well, the other question I've got is, would you like to come with me on a tour around Europe? Uh, I hope so, because we've got the leads of some of tech London advocates and global tech advocates, main European groups, joining me uh, from around the continent. So that'll be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Uh, thank you to those of you who are tweeting and sharing our hashtag GTA Investor Showcase. Uh, that's very uh, good of you. And we've got some brilliant people tuned in, actually. Mike Butcher, editor-at-large for TechCrunch, creator of the Europas, sending us his good wishes. Nice to see you, Mike. What about Janet Coyle, uh, Managing Director of Trade at London and Partners, spearheading Silicon Valley, comes to the UK, fundamentally involved with London Tech Week. Uh, very good to see you in the audience, Janet Coyle. Uh, well, on with the show, as they say. Adrian, uh, we are all ears. Back to you. Sarah, can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Sorry for those technical challenges. Um, thank you for the amazing introduction. We are so delighted and honored to be a part of this incredible event um, featuring investors and entrepreneurs from across Europe. Um, we're really pleased to be having a very open conversation around diversity and inclusion in the sustainable technology startup ecosystem, a topic that is extremely close to the hearts of Tara and I. We plan to cover a lot of ground in this 10 minute session and hopefully will ignite focus, progress and opportunity aligned with our discussion. But before we delve into the conversation, I'd love all of you to learn a bit about my dear friend Tara and her vast experience in the startup and impact investing world. So over to you, Tara. Hi, everyone. Uh, I've been in the impact investing, international development and sustainability I space for about Tara. 15 years. I can hear you now, Adrian. Sorry, I can't hear Tara. Can you hear me now, Tara? I can hear you. Awesome. You hear me? I think, yes, I can hear you well now. Awesome. I'm Good. not okay. sure. You. Yes, awesome. So how about you introduce yourself again, just in case they didn't get it. Great. 
Uh, hi, my name is Tara Sabri. I have been in the impact investing, international development and sustainability space for about 15 years. Uh, I've worked with large multilaterals such as the United Nations and the World Bank, as well as philanthropic foundations and impact funds across Latin America and Africa. And now I'm based in London, where I'm focused on impact investing as an angel, as well as an advisor to larger institutional investors. Awesome. So Tara, let's dive right in. Um, there's no point in ignoring the elephant in the room. There is a clear diversity founder and talent gap aligned with tech startups in general, and the gap is even wider when we think about sustainable tech startups. Um, can you just walk us through the issues aligned with the lack of diversity in the space um, and the obligation from an impact perspective to align businesses with the communities most exposed by the challenges within the constructs of the sustainability ecosystem? You hit the nail on the head that the lack of representation applies both at the local and global level. So if you're looking here in Western markets, people who are most vulnerable to things like lack of clean water or food deserts, it's often communities of color. And then if you were to extrapolate that even globally, looking at you know the issue of feminized poverty, who's most affected when you don't have clean water or access to land, or when you have runoff that affects crops, it's women who are already 70% of the global population living on less than a dollar a day. Um, so we need solutions that integrate those lived experiences, uh, that integrate the insights from those communities, um, and that ultimately will integrate insights and a lived experience from the majority of those the users of many of these products as well. Amazing. Yes, that's great context. Um, I think we would all agree that sustainability is not a privilege. Um, and I think, in fact, for real progress, we must think of it as a communal and collective opportunity. Um, however, there is certainly a clear founder privilege when we think about these new ideas and startups aligned with sustainability. Why is there such a homogeneous success profile in this space? I think that there's two sides to this at least. Part of this is about tech penetration and who who is overrepresented when it comes to STEM education and the tech sector more broadly. See, tech is where you're going to find the types of venture level returns. And so if tech is white male dominated as a sector and that knowledge is white male dominated, and those are the majority of companies that will be venture back. Not to downplay the successes of some of the women-led companies in tech, whether we're looking at you know Charm Impact, which is women-led and focusing on renewable energy in Africa, or we're looking at um, Modularity Grid, which is African women-led and is focusing on mini grids in Africa. Not to downplay that, but this is just a sector-wide issue in tech, uh, where white men and to a lesser extent some Asian men predominate. And then this is an access to capital issue where you have a world where you know, the majority of VC is run by funds uh, that are head by white men that are investing in mostly white male founders. When you bring those two issues together, um, sustain sustainability is not divorced from that. Sustainability is within the broader startup ecosystem. Yeah, and I think you know taking that even a little bit further when we're thinking about um, these diverse founders that are finding success. I think there's a disconnect with success and technology. So what business models are most interesting for diverse founders? It's interesting. See, when you start to think about that, at first you get the impression that there would be a, a, whole, a whole plethora of business models that would make sense for this segment. But that's more true of consumer goods. So actually, you would probably, when it comes to you know, racial demography, you would break this down, you would take a place-based strategy. And the question is more about are sustainability focused businesses focusing here in the West in communities of color? And when it comes to, you know, gender, actually, I would argue that a lot of the sustainability focused business models that um, focus on the general public, uh, clean energy, you know, reducing food waste, a lot of these issues are in a way gender agnostic. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, and just thinking about the technology as it relates to these companies, um, I know we've had a lot of discussions around this, but how can we think about developing 
tech solutions for these startups that are focused on sustainability to activate success, um, success to activate opportunities for VC funding, um, and more importantly, to kind of really increase representation and visibility at showcases like this today. Part of this is just about um, the sustainability e ecosystem becoming more inclusive. And another part of it is about the startup ecosystem becoming more inclusive. And there's a lot of progress over the past year to, to start to do that. So, you know, obviously one tech here in London is one of the big accelerators that's focusing on underrepresented founders. And I believe they're also looking at sustainability. Uh, you have 10 by 10, which I'm sure you've heard of and Cornerstone. Um, these are focusing on, you know, mostly black founders. They don't have a sustainability angle, but can we bring them into the sustainability community? Um, same thing with gender, you know, whether you're looking at Angel Academe or Hermesa, some of these uh, angel groups and accelerators that are focusing on women, how do we also help them emphasize um, and deepen their penetration in the sustainability or clean tech space? Um, and part of that also has to do with the return profiles that are associated with these and the risks that are associated with these kinds of startups vis-a-vis -vis some of the other kinds of startups, whether that's you know, fintech, for example, that don't have the same risk profile. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And in terms of like the talent gap, obviously there's a founder gap, but there's also this major talent gap. When you look at these sustainable startups um, and at all levels and all lines of business, you do see a lack of representation there as well. Are there any resources that you could recommend for recruitment um, for best practices for hiring and identifying diverse talent? Yes, here in the UK, there's BAME recruitment. Um, there's also in the US, 04 recruitment. Both of these are focused on diversifying in terms of race and gender, the talent pipeline. Um, at the board level, if you're looking at Africa, there's the boardroom Africa, which focuses on finding, you know, non-executive directors and board advisors that are women. Um, there's also inclusive boards, which is doing the same thing here in the UK across race and gender lines. So if you know that your startup has massive impact when it comes to SDG 7 or other other SDGs that are associated with climate change, but you also know that you don't really understand the needs of women, you don't really know how to market to communities of color. These are some resources that might help change things internally so you get that perspective um, and are able to shift your strategy to be more inclusive. Awesome. I know we're up against the time clock. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for such a short and rich conversation. Um, I know we could continue speaking about this for hours, and we probably will, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately we've reached time. Um, I can speak for both of us by saying that we are calling all diverse founders um, and emerging diverse founders, investors, and all the passionate parties to connect with us, as this is something that's very close to our hearts and we're really committed to being anchors of development and impact in this space. Um, I'm super grateful for everyone who's joined the session and would love to just turn it over to you, Tara, for any final words. Yes, uh, likewise. There's a lot of synergies that can be tapped um, by becoming more inclusive and more representative, um, and a lot of synergies that can be tapped by linking to the impact space and the sustainability space and some of the resources, whether you're looking at the university accelerators or whether you're looking at tapping impact funding that I don't think the diversity community, i.e. the parts of the startup ecosystem that are really focusing on diversity inclusion, I don't think these two spheres are connecting yet. And so that's another role that we hope to play is to be that bridge to help ensure that the sustainability agenda actually starts to look a lot more like us and that the founders and investors that are ensuring that the startup ecosystem starts to also look like us are integrating these concepts and these tools into their business models as well. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, my huge thanks to Adrian and to Tara for that fascinating conversation. Hugely appreciated. Uh, you are watching the Investor Showcase 3.0, brought to you by Tech London Advocates and Global Tech Advocates. My thanks to you, particularly if you're watching live, for sharing using our hashtag GTA Investor Showcase. Many of you tweeting using the other hashtag Tech. 
for net zero. Much appreciated. Now, we have the investment partner and chief technology officer from Lakestar, hugely renowned. It's one of the largest investors operating in Europe. Uh, it's headquartered in Zurich, and it invests in both early stage and later stage businesses, and it has backed some of Europe's most prominent tech scale up. So, to discuss Europe's hidden sustainability opportunity, it's a great honor to invite you to welcome Stephen Nundy. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to listen to us today and talking about this very important topic. And what I thought would be interesting was just to share a perspective from the venture capital community. Um, my name's Stephen Nundy. I'm one of the partners, as has been mentioned, um, at Lakestar. I'm based here in London, um, and I've been with Lakestar for three years. And my background is I was actually a tech operator um, for 20 years in an investment bank, and so I've come into investment relatively late in my career. But what I thought would be interesting is not only just to talk about sustainability, but to talk a little bit about how Venture thinks about this and how we could be thinking about this slightly differently. Um, a little bit about Lakestar. Um, you can see here, you know, the, one of the aspects to, to note is that we are based in Zurich, Berlin, and also here in London. We're pan-European in nature, and as has been discussed, we invest from um, early stage Series A up to growth as well. And some of the companies we've invested in, you can see on this particular slide, and you can imagine when you are investing in these types of companies, there's plenty of opportunity to think about sustainability on a, on a broader basis when you're impacting the lives of so many consumers. And so when we think about defining sustainability as a, as a venture capital fund, you know, clearly you know, there's been a lot discussed today about the environmental, the social, and the governance aspects of the dimension of, of sustainability. But when we think about this within venture capital, there's really two ways to invest. And obviously, investing in the, the brightest and best startups is, is kind of what we are, are here to do. But you can either invest on a thematic basis, and a lot will be discussed today about how ESG funds or for-purpose funds should be investing and how, how we should be thinking about investing in Europe to make sure that we are, we are investing in the right aspects of companies that are going to be defining um, how the planet looks uh, in the years to come, but also how we operate as a community and how we think about things as a community. But in terms of, you know, in, in terms of this, you've got the climate tech, you've got the food tech, um, fintech and others that you could be um, investing in directly following the SDGs. And there's, there's a number of funds that are emerging in this space, but this is going to take time. Many of us in the investment community have, are coming new to this over the last few years. And so the, the way we're thinking about this um, very much on the venture side is on the right of this, you're seeing how we are supporting um, some of these companies from our own internal practices as well. I'm on the committee of the British Venture Capital Association, and we talk about responsible investing. And this is absolutely a part of how all investors should be considering any investments going forward. You know, we'll be asking lots of questions of our founders when we go through the investment process just to understand what they're doing when it comes to governance, social responsibility, and obviously net zero when it comes to their businesses. But this alone is not necessarily going to, um, going to change the landscape. And so one of the things I wanted to mention was, look, if we aren't an, investment, an impact investor, what should us as investors be doing? What should we be supporting? What can we do? that's live, that's actually available to us now. And essentially, as you'd have seen on one of the earlier slides, we have over 100 companies in our portfolio. And at any one point in time, many of those companies have either a direct sustainability aspect to their technology. We've invested in a number of companies directly that are doing for purpose, for good, be it in, in uh, plastic waste, be it in um, net zero carbon emissions. But also, the, the, the aspect I want to talk about today was the hidden sustainability of the, the technologies that we're investing in as well. And this is where there's, there's externalities that we need to be pushing within our portfolio of companies as an investors. It's important that we're supporting those entrepreneurs and their team's missions in that regard. So I just wanted to talk about four different examples of that. And I'm sure I'd encourage all of you who are out there, either as entrepreneurs or as investors, to really look deep within your portfolio to see where you could be doing more or where you could be helping your existing management teams 
um, make a difference, because making a difference now is what we need to be seen to be doing. And so Sender is a good example I'd like to touch on first. It's a freight forwarding company based out of Germany. Essentially, what they do is they help digital, digitally move 40-foot container lorries around Europe. They have offices um, across the, uh, the European um, Union. And at any one point in time, did you realize that actually one-third of all trucks on the road are actually empty? And so just through technology, we can start reducing the number of, of empty trucks that are going between A and B. That unto itself is going to start reducing the amount of carbon that's going to be put into the environment. And so technology being part of an efficiency program um, is, is what Sender is trying to do, apart from you know, grow its business um, as well. The other aspect which, that Sender has done, which we've been supportive of, is, is looking at advanced fuels. And so you can imagine, a bit like with an Uber, there's surge pricing on different routes around Europe. In this, and additionally to that, Sender are offering freight forwarding companies or companies that are using their service the ability to choose advanced fuels between two, two centers, which reduces carbon emissions by 90%. And so I think that really is then pushing these opportunities back to the large corporates who are moving freight around Europe to make a decision, to actually have a conscious decision as to what they want to do and how do they actually start accruing you know, better carbon offsets and better carbon credits is by actually choosing the fuels that the lorries are running on that are moving their product from A to B. Eigen is a UK company in the natural language processing space. They were initially focused on finance and understanding the details within long-form legal documents. But now their technology is looking at a number of prospectuses and documents that are emerging from corporates around the ESG space, and actually extracting the value within those documents. Lots of long words, lots of legalese, but what we need or what the consumer requires as the world moves forward is actually understand the specificity of some of those documents and exactly what are people signing up to. And so using natural language processing, we can look at hundreds and thousands of documents from different corporates around Europe and the world, and then compare as those versions change whether those sustainability goals are being reached, adjusted, or missed. Glovo is in the food delivery space. They're based in Barcelona. They're delivering food to over 860 cities around Southwest Europe, the Balkans, and North Africa. Um, you've seen the phenomenon of food delivery over the last few years and how that has really kind of taken over our day-to-day -day lives. But Glovo being out there with their, their, their number of, of Glovo drivers, scoot, scooter riders and walkers, you know, there's a lot that they can do when it comes to helping in terms of sustainability. So we've been supporting them in ensuring that over 25% of all their restaurants are actually collecting the food waste at the end of each evening and distributing it through their partner channels in the local cities to families and to charities that need it to make sure that the, the rider jackets and the coats are actually made of sustainable and recyclable materials, and to making sure that any vehicles that they are using are going to be carbon net zero by the end of next year. The last one I'll talk about is Clearglass, a UK fintech who are working in the um, pension space. There was a directive that the regulator came out with a number of years ago to look for transparency within the pension space to make sure that we fully understand exactly what are our pensions actually investing in, what are the transaction fees that are incurred through the life cycle of a pension. Now, that kind of governance is something that we take for granted. Of course, we believe that our pension companies are doing right by us as the, the, the generation in the future that's going to be receiving these pensions. But those costs are sometimes hidden. And so Clearglass are really adding to the governance factor by ensuring that um, each company is disclosing exactly these transaction fees so we can make choices, but also looking at the underlying ESG credentials of each of these pension funds as well, similar to Eigen, who have data locked up in long-form documents. So, in summary, I just talked about four different uh, companies in our portfolio, but I'd really just be encouraging you all to look within your, your current portfolio of companies that you've invested in. Whilst we absolutely need to be investing in the new startups that are emerging, that are looking at directly impacting um, our sustainability goals here within Europe. We also need to be looking within the current portfolio and making sure that as investors and as, as good board members, um, we are also helping these companies prioritize the right thing to make sure that they're also looking to see what, these, what they can do in-house today because a lot of these companies already have significant reach within the environment and within the, the current European ecosystem. And so we've got to be looking for change from within at the same time as looking for these new impact opportunities as investors going forward. Thank you.
Well, my huge thanks to Stephen Nundy there from Lake Star. More about them at lakestar.com. Uh, you're tuned into the Investor Showcase 3.0, brought to you by the Global Tech Advocates and the Tech London Advocates. And uh, huge thanks to you for joining us wherever you're tuned in from. It's fascinating to think that, frankly, when we did Web Mission back in 2008, Tech for Good was practically a petting zoo off to the side of a huge conference. And thank goodness at last it has the main stage, and rightly so. But what about measurement if we're talking about impact? Well, that's what our next panel will examine, the importance of data and measurement to inspire meaningful change around environmental impact. I'm delighted to say that my first co-host for this Investor Showcase 3.0 is Flavilla Fongang, who will be moderating this session. You may know Flavilla already. She's the founder of branding agency Three Colors Rule. And of course, Flavilla also leads the TLA Black Women in Tech Working Group. Uh, it's lovely to see you, uh, Flavilla, with such a good panel. And I leave the, you, uh, you with this next brilliant session. Good luck. A nice welcome and yes super exciting we're going to be talking about measure and data so as i say my name is flavilla fongang and i'm the founder of three colors rule the, cre the creative branding agency and also the founder of tla black women in tech so i'm super excited to be here today and i'm going to be hosting a panel debate about the importance of measurement and data to quantify and inspire action yes we're talking about action Technology has radically increased mm -hmm. our ability to capture and analyze data, and that capability to quantify the environmental impact of everything an individual or business does should enable us to create a more sustainable future. We have a panel of investors and experts to discuss the role measurement and data can play in achieving a net zero carbon future. How are you? We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Richard, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Richard spent 35 years working BP roles, included CFO, COO. He is then was also the CEO of Centrica, Centrica Business and is now the non executive director at the tank storage company, Vopac. How are you? I'm very good. Fantastic. Thank you. Great to be here. I know. I'm yeah. excited. We're going to have such a great time together. Sam, how are you? Good, thank Looking you. Looking great. <laughs> She's the founder of Net Purpose, whose mission is to impact measurement effortless for all investors by 2025. You have about four years left. I know. I we're know. working hard over here. Very quickly. <laughs> Rosario, how are you? Excellent. I'm very good. Yes. Rosario Dio is the CEO of RDD Ventures Consulting, a commercial manager at the London Waste of Recycling Board and lead of the TLA Circular Economy Working Group. Coffee medals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we have online people couldn't join us today. We have Karen. Karen, how are you? Great. She's Thank here. You very yes. Much. She's a chief investment officer at the Scale, Vent Scale Up Venture Capital Trust Beringue. And last but not least, Professor. How are you, Professor Steve Evans? I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear him. So I, I just thought I'd change the mood. <laughs> yes. He's, in, he's a director of research at the Institute for Manufacturing at the University of Cambridge. I'm going to start and grill you, and I'm going to start with Richard. Richard, you've, you have worked at some of the world's largest energy companies. How do you adopt new technologies to reduce environmental impact, and why is data so important in terms of driving internal innovation? That's a great question, Favela. I'm going to take it backwards, if I may, and start with the data point, because I think data is absolutely critical. Without data, then it, it, you really don't know where you are. You have to understand exactly what your emissions are, uh, where you're, you're heading in terms of uh, sustainability, and you need to measure that. You also need to be able to understand the economic benefit of taking action. Uh, and so you also need some very careful measurement uh, around that as well. Uh, and lastly, in terms of the ability to set targets and to align those targets to incentives is really important. So once you've got the data in, in place, then the next thing you really need to be thinking about is do I have the capability to take action to hit yes. those, those targets? And capability, you can build it within a large company, you can have a center of expertise, you can have experts in, in each particular geography, the challenges may be different, mm. but equally you need an ecosystem. Uh, and an ecosystem means bringing in outside help and support, 
doesn't matter how big the biggest companies are, they don't have all the answers. And so creating that ecosystem is a real great way of bringing in outside partners, be they large, medium, or small, building that ecosystem, uh, and then creating you know, sustainable uh, partnerships, whether it be joint ventures, investments in these companies. Uh, and that's the way you can bring technology in and, and really start to apply it. 100%. And I love this word, ecosystem. Never work individually. It always has to be a, really an effort, joint effort. I love Absolutely. that. Rosario, are you ready? My question I for you, you are, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you are involved with circular economy startups and very London. How does a city like London can use data to you know, better service, reduce waste? Actually, it's quite uh, uh, recent news. We have embarked, together with the, the ReLondon, the London Waste and Recycling Board, into a massive research task. We're going to uh, track the material flow. The project is called Material Flow Analysis. We're going to measure how much stuff, the stuff we buy, we consume, we use and we dispose of, how much of this flows in food, uh, textile, plastics, built environment materials. They get in London, they get processed and they get disposed. Yes. So based on the, this massive amount of data, we will be able to build an analytical framework, a model to start identifying where in this supply chain we can identify with all the boards and the local authorities in London, the hotspots, the elements where we can uh, intervene more effectively as a public body. So again, really is creating a data-driven framework for decision making. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. No. Simple as that. Yes. Mm. So look forward to being able to share forward further this, the results of this research project. Yes, you cannot measure. You cannot measure if you don't have a data, if you don't have KPIs, and I think that's very important. Steve, on the other side, Steve, professor, if everyone introduced a better measurement system, do you think you will start focusing on different things to minimize impact, and how can you, how can businesses better use data? That's a big question. It's a big question, so I'm going to ignore it and answer my own question, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm going to go from Rosario's point. Did you know that it takes about two tons of material per week to support your lifestyle? Nope. So someone somewhere is digging up two tons. If you don't know that number, if you don't know how those materials flow, how can we change the system? And that's back to Rosario's point. So he's already made the point about the importance of data. We need to be able to see things. Once we see them, we can make changes. We often talk about what gets measured gets done, but we need to understand the link between measurement and action. It's not automatic. It's not a single step. And I would say that one of the biggest changes that's really happening now across businesses is that data is doing for energy and carbon what the eye has consistently done for decades on labor and capital. If I go into a factory and I see somebody not working very efficiently, I can tell that immediately. My eye gives me the data. Yes. I cannot look at the same process and tell whether the energy is being used efficiently. And that's one of the big things that data will now give us is eye, line of eyesight onto things like energy and many other important dimensions. Yes, eyesight. If we don't have that, where are we going? We're just going blind. <laughs> I have a question for you, Sam. Yes. Investors and bankers are very good at gathering and using data to inform their work, let's say, to make money. But why is it so difficult to apply relating, use ESG you know, information, and how is this changing? Fabulous. <laughs> 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 and it's such actually a good synergy between yeah. all the other panelists because what we're doing is making impact measurement effortless for investors. And the problem there is that you've got all this new data coming out from thousands of companies across the world and a whole host of investors mobilizing trillions of dollars to invest in more sustainable solutions and making sense of what is impactful and what is not across thousands of companies is quite the challenge. Yeah. Um, so I think until now, disclosure on quantitative performance on things like energy usage and clean energy acquisition mm. and metric tons of waste generated and plastics in production processes hasn't been available, but now it is. I think 90% of companies are just starting to disclose these metrics. And as investors who like to measure and da use data to make different decisions, we're providing 
a central repository of all that information across thousands of companies so they can use that effortlessly. Um, and I guess the data, it's a really interesting space because the data comes from different directions. I mean, not just financial performance, which is company only. We grab company performance information, but then we validate it with macro statistics and right. evidence from research and other things to bring together the scientific lens and yes. help investors make good decisions. Yes, I love that. Data and transparency, super yeah. key. Karen, you with us? We're going to be talking about Beringue. And BMG is working with investors to change the way we measure ESG. Tell us about the campaign and what would you like to see? Yeah, sure. Well, in, first, I'm, I'm really excited about Sam's effortless process because right now it feels like a lot of effort. So I look forward to that. Um, yeah, what, what we're primarily working on is basically an initiative that has two sides. One is um, providing a framework for startups to start baselining and measuring their ESG footprint, which includes... Um, carbon footprint. Um, and the second half of the initiative is basically how can we do it for you? Um, and how can we help you on the process to improve those things? I mean, one of the key challenges, I think, we work with companies who are primarily in Series A, which mean they're everywhere from almost nothing in revenue to the largest are going to be about 100 million in revenue. And while I think the private equity industry is pretty well down the journey of how do we go about measuring and how do we put resources against it, for early stage startup and growth cap companies, a lot of the issue is not do I want to do it? Because no CEO would say, I'm not interested. The challenge is, I'm trying to keep the lights on. I'm trying to make payroll. I've already got 50 things that my investors and regulatory bodies are asking me to report against. I don't even know what any of this looks like. How do I have resources to report against it? So um, while I, I wouldn't say our framework is perfect, it's, an, it's a simplification of things we've seen on a more sophisticated level for larger scale companies. Um, and it allows a relatively simple measurement. But by way of example, when we were piloting it, and we now have about 70 VCs in the industry involved, and if there's anybody listening who would like to take part, we would really welcome it. Um, but uh, while we were piloting the initiative, one of the questions, which doesn't relate to carbon, but relates to ESG, was do you measure the gender pay gap? And one of the companies that was participating came back and said, well, I don't think we pay anyone other than the receptionist. So no, we don't measure it, but we'll try and do that at some point. And if we had to, we'd say um, we pay the women 100% more than we pay the men right now. Um, and that's kind of just one of the challenges that early stage startups face in, in being asked to report against some of these things. Yes, very big challenge. I have now a question for the entire panelists. OK, so would data give us a common language for startups, corporates, and governments to speak to one another and align their efforts to minimize environmental impact. And why is this not happening right now? Richard, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think having that common language is absolutely critically important mm. because if you take the, the macro view of the challenge, unless we have big corporates, startups, NGOs, governments all working together, we're not going to be able to get to where we need to as, mm. as a society. And that applies to all aspects of, of, of ESG. I think what we need are standards. Uh, you know, we all talk a common financial language. Mm. And in part, that's because over decades and decades, various standards have been established that when we talk about profit, it tends to be defined and measured in the same way or depreciation or whatever it happens to be. We need that same framework uh, in the world of sustainability because once that's in place, then we can have a, a very consistent approach. It's that ecosystem I talked about again, involving all of those various actors. Uh, and with that common language, you can set targets. Everyone knows what they mean. We can measure progress. We can put plans in place. We know what the outcomes will be. So critically important. Uh, and it really needs all of those bodies to come together. And it's not quite there yet. It's not quite there yet. And as you say, framework is important. We talk about transparency. We talked about KPIs. What about you, Steve? What do you have to say? Um, I'm, I'm going to say that data can never be a common language. You know, data is like letters, and knowledge is like words, and language has meaning. But that doesn't mean the question isn't incredibly important. We need common languages. And you've already heard Karen and Sam trying to develop their own common languages around ESG metrics. And that's what we're observing. We're, we're observing multiple common languages being generated by people who are trying to solve very specific problems. The trouble is that we want somehow uh, some, some super entity to make sure that we're speaking Esperanto, that we're all speaking the same language behind our specific implementation. And I think that's really challenging. The ecosystem is emerging. 
the subject is really near. The ecosystem is busy trying to survive, and I don't think there's enough room to experiment and for people to invest in the common language development. So good luck to Karen and Sam. <laughs> well, I, can probably I was actually coming to Sam now to ask you to answer this question. Please do tell us, because Steve literally just challenged you right there. Yeah, no, I think it's fabulous. Um, I mean, I definitely see it very much like financial accounting standards, which most people are not familiar, but weren't formalized until the early 2000s when we had massive collapses and it was forced to kind of consolidate across geographies. I do think we're in a similar stage now, and we've had all this experimentation on standards, but what we did actually was when we started Net Purpose, not create something new, take mm. everything out there, put it on one page, and map all the standards together, and I think that's what makes it effortless. And what we found is that actually everyone's talking about the same thing in different words, for the large part, across themes. So from my point of view, I think we're closer to yes. standardization than we might think, but we're still in that experimentation. Some positive word. What about you, Rosario? Well, uh, you know, I'm Sicilian, so I like proverbs. <laughs> and <the> necessity <laughs> is the mother of all the inventions. So we had COVID, people had that on their plate. With that, we have a recession, and now we have the climate change challenge. So that will push many actors yeah. to do that, to get there. Yes, we need to be pushed to the edge for us to take action. Karen, to, to answer the same question, what do you have to say? Yeah, I, I mean, it, this, especially in early stages, this is relatively new to the industry. The concepts aren't, but trying to do something is relatively new. And trying to standardize it is almost getting ahead of ourselves. I, I think we're still in the position where this is, this is a, an industry where perfect is going to be the enemy of good for the moment. Um, we're still trying to figure out what the right frameworks look like. And of course, they're not all going to be the same for every company, and there isn't one size fits all. But for example, we, we have a number of people who continue asking us, what is an ESG policy? Um, and we're running workshops as part of the initiative to help define an ESG policy. But the reality is, even if you don't know what it is, write something down. And that's better than what you had before. Um, and if you don't know what to do about measuring the gender pay gap, do something, and that's better than what you did before. If you don't know what to do about your carbon footprint, start recycling in the office, and that's better than what you did before. And all of those things are the right things to be doing, whether we're speaking the common language or not. And the language will evolve over time, and we will have more standards. But right now, it, it's more about just doing something and letting us help you to try and do something, rather than getting it perfect, measuring it perfectly, and having everything be completely standardized. That is nirvana, and that's where we want to get to in order to be able to benchmark and provide best practices. But I think for at least next year, it starts with just doing something. Doing something. I think that's something we have to remember. Do something. Now, I have another question. What are the small steps? It doesn't have to be small. What are the steps, actually? Steps smaller businesses and startups can take to better measure and track their environmental impact? It's always a question. I'm going to start with you, Rosario. Well, uh, you know, uh, I've got a bit of an anecdote there. I remember being in a, in a dinner with uh, some stakeholders of the ecosystem. Everybody wanted to be aspirational. And uh, me, as usual, was the contrarian, saying, no, let's start small. Start measuring menial things, basic things that will give you learnings, experience to build on, and common standards to relate and compare with other stakeholders. Don't be too ambitious, otherwise they will paralyze you. I love that. Steve, what do you think? I love that. I'm going to start with Steve because Steve is going to give us a great controversial answer. <laughs> so I look forward to that one. Well, <laughs> well I'm, afraid I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to agree with the previous speakers and then I'm going to find <laughs> a reason to be different. Um, no, perfection is the enemy of the good. Thank you for that quote already. I, I think that we do worry sometimes what about this measurement system? And actually, one of the things that I'm observing is large companies in particular are very worried because if they name a particular form of measurement, they are concerned that the NGOs will pile in and tell them that they've chosen the wrong one. Yeah. So there's plenty of reasons to feel the potential for freezing and not taking action. And I yeah. would encourage yeah. action. Thank you, Karen, for making that point. If there is a measurement, I would say that most companies that I know can name their four biggest impacts within 30 seconds. Yeah. But they want somebody like me with my signature and my fancy title to somehow make them confident. <laughs> no, just use the four. And the only measure I want to know is how much better you are next year than you were last year. That's how you get on the journey. Pick your four targets and give me a percentage better next year. Yeah. I love that. Karen. 
Oh, we can't hear you, Karen. Oh, okay, we're going to come back to Karen because we can't hear her. Richard, what do you have to say about that? <coughs> I mean, I, ha I have to agree with the previous panelists, but what I would say uh, is that the long term and the short term, the immediate and things you might do in two, three years' time, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm. Uh, and of course, you need to do both. You need to start doing the things you can do today, tomorrow, but equally, you need to think about your product or your service. Mm -hmm. What's the carbon footprint of that, for example? How do I design in, from the outset, carbon neutrality? Uh, because if you can do that, it's much better than figuring out two years' time that you then have to retrofit something. So I would say do both. You know, think about what you can do today, but also have an eye to the horizon. Where do you want to be in two years, in five years? How do I make myself sustainable by that time and work towards that as well? Yes, I love that vision. So important. Karen, are you with us? We'd love to yeah, hear what you have to I say. think I'm here. <laughs> Over to you. That's great, thanks. No, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And with, with regards to our own initiative, half of the initiative is the framework. But to be honest, there will be a self-selection process. Some things will be much more um, effective for some companies than others. The second half of the initiative is basically how do we do it for you? If you're hosting training sessions um, and live workshops, such that if you have no resources to put against this, but you want to do something, um, as Steve said earlier, you end the year better than where you started because the whole point of what we want is for people to feel like they are absolutely making progress and they're included. Yes, I love that. I love that. Sam, I have another question and I want to start with you. Startups are used to pitching to investors. Yes, all yes. the time. <laughs> if you're going to start pitching and measuring ESG, what will this change about how they need to present themselves? I think that's a very important question and I want to start with you. Yeah, I think there's actually probably two angles to that. I think a lot of startups are probably pitching themselves as ESG and as sustainable at the moment because it's a very hot theme. But as we've said, quantifying that is quite difficult, especially when you've got one person that you're paying and no one else. Um, so I think um, I think it'll change the way that like metrics are rolled out throughout all companies over time. But I think for startups right now, defining your purpose and your product is the pure thing and making sure that that product that you're building, you're familiar with all of the different implications from an environmental point of view of that. And that'll depend on your industry yeah. and your energy usage mm. principally. Uh, but I think that'll come through more. Um, and that's the question that investors should be asking startups because I think it's really about startups are quite small, typically low um, employee footprint. And it's really what you're building, which will be driving your emissions today and your emissions way into the future, especially if you're venture backed and you're going to scale that product, let's at least make sure that it's sustainable in the first I instance. I agree. I agree. Vision, purpose, so important. Rosario? I would say outcomes. Yes. Show outcomes in your business plan. I've seen so many business plans of startups producing the pie in the sky of sales targets. Show me that you reduced the CO2 emissions by. I used to actually manage a startup and I told my investors, we're going to make a car, one ton, disappear from the sky. Okay, that's already... So even an element of communication mm -hmm. of outcomes, but stop talking about we're going to do this, we're going yes. to do that. Show me a result, an outcome of what you're going to Absolutely. do or what you've done, even better. Absolutely. Richard, give me your answer in 10 seconds. 10 seconds? <laughs> I, I think you're going to have to do it because your customers are going to demand it, your financiers are going to demand it, mm -hmm. your suppliers are going to demand it. We saw, for example, a court case last month, mm -hmm. Shell in the Netherlands, <laughs> accountable yeah. for all of their emissions. They're going to want to know every step of their supply chain, exactly what's happening yes. and what they're doing. If you want to do business with Shell, you're going to have to do this. Yes, Steve, 10 seconds, give me your answer. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a co-founder of a number of clean tech startups and I've done the pitching. Most of mine fall into the category of inherent. It's, it's in our nature to be trying to deliver against the ESG. It tends to be easy. We have, a, we have absorbed the language over many years. Yes. For others, where it's unintended, that's where the challenge is, but what I'm observing is people are learning really quickly and we just got to give them a chance to have that conversation. They must be transparent about their method yes. and don't overclaim. Yes, Karen, 10 seconds, over to you. Yeah, I think for us, it's less about how do they pitch to us and how do we pitch to them in terms of what are we going to do to help you with this ESG initiative? Because everybody wants to do it. It's just the resources and where and how. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. My panelists were amazing, and I hope that you enjoyed the session. Do something. That's how we're going to finish it off. And we're done. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> well, what a brilliant note to end it on. My huge thanks to that whole panel, but ably chaired by Flavilla Fongang. Thank you, Flavilla. Uh, great to see you. Um, so many bits of feedback coming in from you, uh, wherever you're tuning in from. So thank you. Nick Constantinou says, do something. It's better than nothing. The obsession with language and perfection is a real barrier. Well said, uh, says Nick. Uh, lots of good feedback for Steve there, beaming in uh, from Cambridge, I think, Steve. Uh, Pick your four targets, uh, says Steve. Gives us our Star Wars phrase of the day. Use the four, in Steve's words. So we're very grateful for that. My question, is Karen in her own sauna? We'll have to find out another time. It doesn't really matter, uh, does it? But what are your further questions? Uh, keep them coming to us as we go through our session today. Our hashtag GTA Investor Showcase, or Investment Showcase, I should say. Right, now it's time for a keynote speech from, frankly, the oracle of investment data, from his volcanic lair. That's right, he's known for his work tracking unicorns, fintech funding rounds, female-founded businesses, and international investment. Let's put it this way. If a funding round isn't on Bohurst's database, it's probably not worth knowing about. Uh, so please give a virtual welcome to the head of research and consultancy at Bohurst, Henry Warwood. Thank you, Ollie, for those incredibly kind words and good evening to everyone in the studio and joining us online. Uh, my name is Henry Warwood. I lead the research and consultancy team at Bohurst. And this evening, I'm going to uh, very quickly, in about five minutes, talk to you about three things. Firstly, uh, and apologies for those of you who've heard it before, I'll tell you a little bit um, about Bohurst. Then I'll be talking about the investment trends across the UK. Uh, and then I'll be talking a little bit about clean tech uh, investment trends in particular. So if in the uh, immortal words of Chris Whitty, and apologies if someone's made that joke before, can I have my next slide, please? So Bohurst tracks the UK's ambitious private companies. We're cracking around 32,000 businesses. Uh, and since we started in 2011, we've tracked over 40,000. Uh, so there's an 8,000 8, there that have exited and a handful um, have unfortunately died as well. In order to identify those companies, uh, we look at a number of triggers. And if I could have my next slide, please. So we look at any company raising any amount of equity. As, as Ollie alluded to there, we actually track every, every single equity round. Um, so from the, friend, the friends and family round, um, starting you know, for if you raise 10k from your friends and family we'll we'll track that round uh, and then we will also track um all the way through to multi hundred million dollar rounds uh, we also track companies um attending accelerators spinning out from universities uh, receiving innovation grants and and many more but the the data I'm going to speak to this evening is the investment data so if I could have my next slide please so uh, I'm very pleased to be able to present actually quite a positive, uh, positive chart here. So we can see in 2020, private companies across the UK raised almost 15 billion pounds across 6,226 transactions. Now, at the beginning of uh, 2020, I actually thought we were going to be we were going to see a record year, and 2020 would overtake 2019's year. Obviously, I didn't foresee uh, everything that would happen uh, with uh, coronavirus and the world's reaction to it. But uh, come April or sort of re revisited that and thought actually this is probably going to have a, a pretty severe impact and I predicted 2020 would be quite down on 2019's number. So uh, take everything I say with a pinch of salt because I managed to be wrong twice uh, last year and we actually see a pretty impressive number for 2020 given everything that's happened. Perhaps more excitingly is what's happening already uh, this year in 2021 over um, 10 billion, uh, over 11 billion, sorry, uh, invested before the, the half of this year is even over. 
And indeed, this number is already out of date. I made this presentation on Friday evening last week, uh, and that 2021 number has already risen to 12.2 billion. Um, some of you may have seen CMR Surgical's enormous uh, $600 million round, pumping that number up even further. If I could have my next slide. You can really uh, start to see the impact here of uh, coronavirus in that uh, dip in 2020. And then you see the recovery under, well underway in uh, Q1 with a huge number of deals and a huge amount invested, a, a record quarter. Uh, again, that Q2 data that I've got there is out of date and it's looking like it will end um, on a sort of level peg uh, with uh, Q1. If I could have my next slide. Um, sorry. Uh, yes, so uh, clean tech uh, investment. Uh, although the uh, the theme for today has been around ESG, I focused in on clean tech because, frankly, it's the easiest uh, to define. We're talking about here about hardware um, startups and scale ups uh, who ha whose hardware has applications towards um, addressing uh, environmental concerns. Um, as the panel before me will, will have alluded to, the, the data and classification around um, achieving ESG goals more widely and uh, sustainable development goals as well uh, is a bit of a, a thornier issue. So I've, I've got the, the sim more simplistic uh, subgroup here to talk about. And although 2019 and 2020 looks roughly similar to, to what we saw for the, the UK-wide investment market, it is a bit disappointing to see in 2021 um, it lagging. And we've not seen the sort of the record uptake uh, that, that we've seen in, in other sectors. I think this points out that there's um, still quite a lot uh, to be done in terms of driving investment to this sector. Now, obviously, the companies in this sector being hardware companies have distinctly different capital requirements to, to software businesses. So it's, it's understandable. Many investors may also still be feeling, feeling the burns on their fingers from having got involved in clean tech in, in 2010 and 2011, when, when a lot of uh, investors uh, failed to, to make the returns that they were anticipating. If I could have my next slide, uh, and this is my um, final slide for anyone who's, who's monitoring the time. Apologies if I'm, I'm running over. Um, and this just shows the investors who are already investing uh, in the space. So uh, a shout out to, to everyone who is investing in the, these hardware companies that are going to make um, a big difference over the next uh, decade to, to reaching um, net zero and all of the other climate goals that, that we've set ourselves. Um, you can see here some, some interesting names. Uh, Crowdcube and Cedars are just top investors by volume across the UK. But campaigns that come onto those platforms uh, addressing environmental concerns do seem to be very popular as well. Cornish Lithium being an example that recently closed quite a large round on a crowdfunding platform. Um, so it's interesting to see that uh, retail investors may be slightly ahead of the curve, or perhaps another way of thinking of it is are, are more willing to, to take to take the, the huge risk in investing in these kinds of, of hardware companies. Um, and if I could just have my, my last slide, um, I've uh, whist whistled through quite a lot of data there. Please feel free to, to drop me a line if you've got any questions or want any um, further clarifications on what I've presented. Otherwise, I will hand back to Ollie in the studio. Thank you very much, Henry Warwood. Now, I think, Henry, if you can stay with me just for one moment, unless I get told otherwise, because I've got a quick couple of questions for you. First question, if we think about some of the real titans of investment who backed maybe the biggest fintech successes, not all of them seem to have entered the arena yet. What do you think they're waiting for? So I, I think the, the, the reason for those investment um, some investors not yet investing in this space is to do with, as I mentioned, those those capital in re requirements. Investing in um, companies that already have revenue uh, or have a clear path to revenue and a clear um, trajectory for how that revenue is going to go is, is a very different game to investing into uh, companies where there's a huge upfront cost on developing uh, the technology. And you don't even know necessarily you know, what the landscape for commercially commercializing that technology is going to look like after you've put in the five to ten years to, to develop um, the IP that's going to, going to underpin it. Um, so we, we used to speak about the need to introduce um, patient capital to, to the funding landscape. Uh, I think some, some positive changes have happened on that front, but I think we need a further sort of additional class of, of even more patient capital that can, can address this. 
and that's willing to, to take that that extra risk that comes with the asset class in order to to get the the payoff that that will accrue to us all through through addressing the these ESG um, issues. Yeah. Final question, Henry, and then we must march on because we can't be as patient as we'd like to be this afternoon. Um, <laughs> what hope, if any, do you see that the founders of this next wave of companies are a little more diverse than their predecessors across other industries? This remains a huge problem worth solving. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, t data, as ever, remains a problem. We've got good sight on on gender diversity amongst uh, the, the founders of these businesses in terms of um, ethnic diversity and other protected characteristics. But just on the, uh, the, the gender piece, there is there are signs of the, the picture Im improving. Um, we are seeing more, more, more and more of the businesses we track um, have female founders in their founding teams. That has yet to properly trickle down into the investment numbers, though. So although there are some, some excellent initiatives out there, such as the Investing in Women Code, um, we've yet to see the sort of true, true pay, pay off of those in the data. Yeah, excellent. Lots more questions coming in, and they will have to wait till next time we meet. For now, from Boathurst, Henry Warwood, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're Thank very you. grateful, by the way. We're hugely grateful to Bohurst for their support across so many of our events. Henry, they're right in the middle of the deal radar, if you like. So thank you. Now, uh, it is my pleasure to hand over the reins once more to one of my next co-hosts, Safia Qureshi. Uh, this is going to be a panel on a fascinating question because it's about the different routes available to startups looking to access funding. A brief word about Safia. Safia is the founder and chief executive of Club Zero. That's a business that's doing exactly what today's event is all about. Why? Well, because by replacing disposable cups with returnable cups, Sophia is really driving a positive impact on the environment and also scaling a great business in the process. And by the way, as an entrepreneur, I'm sure she will relish the chance to turn the tables on a panel of investors and funders today. So she is joining us virtually and a hugely warm welcome to you, Sophia. Welcome everyone, delighted to be joining all of you. Hope you've had a great session so far. I'm Safia, founder and CEO of Club Zero, as mentioned. Um, I work in the returnable packaging infrastructure system, so we're building sustainable consumption models for cities um, as we speak. So I'm very deeply invested in the circular economy business, uh, which means that this is a very interesting topic uh, to be having with other VCs um, here today. I'm very excited to deep dive. As a founder and CEO, I've got, of course, firsthand been in the trenches, raised um, about 1.2 million to date. Um, and so I know the trials and tribulations, quite often the, the, the descriptions on what and how and the impact aspect um, that comes into working and operating in a sustainable tech team startup. So for this panel, Really excited to bring together um, leading experts that range across different investment routes. Um, so we've created a really fun diversity uh, for you, which I hope you'll find exciting. There's corporate procurement, there's VC investment, there's public markets. Um, so all in the mix. Um, and this is about access to funding for startups. So uh, let me introduce you to everyone joining me in the studio. In no particular order, we have Priya. Priya, it's wonderful to have you here. Priya is the former Council General of UK Government in San Francisco and now a partner at Marion Ventures. We're also joined by Alistair Hayes, who's a founder and CEO of Aquis Exchange, a pan-European alternative trading system. Sounds very exciting. And joining us virtually, well, we're all virtual, um, is also Carola Wall, the former Chief of Trans Transformation and Market Management at, at AXA and now a Board Director for General Eye Insurance. Carol is joining us from Zurich. Um, and also on the call is 
Gary. So Gary Stewart, who is dialing in from New York, uh, and the former head of Weira UK, who runs Founder Tribes, uh, a new platform that connects underrepresented, underrepresented uh, entrepreneurs <coughs> with investors around the world. Definitely know what that looks and feels like as being one myself. <laughs> so lovely to have everyone here. Um, and we've created a nice, fun environment. So um, hopefully, this will be a dynamic conversation with you all. Um, so I'd like to start with putting some questions out. Priya, I'm going to pick on you first. Um, would you be able to maybe talk us through your organization process um, to find out how you back new startups? Love to know that. And what do you look for? How can a startup impress you? Go. Thank you so much, Safia. An absolute delight to, to be here for this discussion. I mean, the reality is, is that there are many routes to finding the best and brightest new entrepreneurs out there. Obviously, we're active in the tech ecosystem on both sides of the Atlantic, where our investment focus is. And so we often will hear of a new business that we're excited about. In our case, um, that business needs to be a female founded or female co-founded business because we only invest in those companies. But I think when you also are looking at the process of deal origination, it's really important to have a means by which founders can come to you proactively if they don't happen to be in your immediate network. So one of the ways that we do that is by having a sort of pitch us part of our website. So maryinventures.com forward slash pitch. And anybody can apply directly to us um, via that website to make sure that we're sort of democratizing the way that we see deals, for want of a better word. In terms of what we look for, I mean, you know, we are looking for things that many of other investors will be looking for. They're not legendary, but they're important. It's things like a clear articulation of the problem. People often mm -hmm. focus on what the solution is, the technology that they have, which is great. But actually, what I need to know is what's the problem you're trying to solve? And if you can describe that and start with that, that's a really great place for, for me to hear what you're trying to do. I think the other really, really important thing to never lose sight of is customer traction. Have you got traction in the market already? Have you got an idea that people are getting excited about, that people want to buy, want to hear more about? That's really, really important. Yeah. And then the other thing that I think is always fundamental is the team. I don't want to just hear about your idea or the problem you're trying to solve. I want to hear about who you are. Are you a really great founder? Are you a great leader? Can you attract the sort of talent you're going to need as you scale your business? So those are the sorts of things. And if you tick all those boxes, that's a wow factor for us and for other investors too. Brilliant. Yeah, totally hear you on the human equity piece, which is, it's all about the team. And it works both ways. VC founder fit, VC team fit. Uh, it's also about the team on the other side. Um, excellent. Okay, so Alistair, got a question for you here. Tell us about right. Aquas Exchange. Why are alternative markets an attractive funding route for startups? And what sort of sectors do you most commonly work with? Okay, Safair, thanks very much indeed. Well, for those of you who don't know about Aquis Exchange, we're actually the seventh largest stock exchange in Europe today. We trade in 1,700 stocks across 15 different markets. A year ago, though, we got involved in the primary markets, the only other recognized investment exchange in the United Kingdom outside of the London Stock Exchange. And the reason behind that is we felt very strongly that growth companies were not able to access capital through the public markets in an efficient way. And I think the way, best way to look at this is, is uh, we think that companies are very much like children. They start small, they grow, and ultimately mature. But when we have our children, we send them off to primary school where they learn how to learn, and they have different behaviors, and they have different ways of teaching. 
Then we move them off to secondary school, where again, the teaching changes, the behaviors change, and children sort of learn how to become adults. And then eventually we send them off in a more mature stage into university, um, and where you have again, very different types of treat teaching and very different types of behaviors. Now, the problem with the United Kingdom when it comes to public markets is we tend to have just one size fits all regulation. And we all know that companies that are a three million pound market cap, trade differently, act differently to those companies that are, say, 200 million market cap, which trade very differently to those 3 billion. And what we were trying to provide at Aquis is a school that allows early stage companies to have things that are proportionate regulation and appropriate trading mechanisms in order to actually get companies to get financed earlier. We think the public markets need to get the public back into them. And the public can provide an enormous amount of capital. And there's been a tremendous fear today um, of companies going to the public markets at an earlier stage. It's tended to be used very much as private equity selling companies at a much, much later stage. And we think that's wrong. So we're here to help companies grow through financing at a very early stage. Now, you ask which sort of sectors? Well, actually, we cover 16 sectors um, across the market. Uh, most of these, which we're doing today, are now new economy type businesses, digitalized businesses. We have everything from uh, blockchain businesses, uh, anything from uh, cannabis businesses. We've seen e-commerce businesses. And these are the growth companies of the future. So we're looking for people who want to bring their company public. It's not the very, very first angel investing, but it's when the company, a startup, is starting to get revenue, starting to prove itself. Then we think it's ideal for those companies to actually come to the public markets. And that's how Aquis is positioning itself. Brilliant. And what's, what size are you, I mean, expecting the business to be when they come to you? Well, uh, you know, at, at the early stage, what we call the access market, uh, which gets all the same privileges as, as uh, a growth market such as AIM, no stamp duty, inheritance tax relief, all these things, our average size there is somewhere around about 10 to 12 million pounds market cap. But we've seen companies coming at as, as small as sort of two or three million pound market cap. Apex, we've got 21 companies in there, um, and their average is around about, uh, well, it's 87 million at the moment. Um, and obviously, as you start growing up, we get to companies that go onto the main market, our university, at around about the 700 to 800 million. And obviously, at that stage, they're not startups. What we're really focusing on is how we get this early stage access, how we get hundreds of these companies to come on board, because they are the Microsoft, Googles, Netflix, Amazons of the future. And we want to be the exchange will be the home of growth companies. Yeah, amazing. Brilliant. Thank you for that. It's good. Um, over to you, Carola. It's challenging for startups to understand the complexity and nuances of corporate procurement processes. <laughs> Been there. Uh, still in there. <laughs> what does a startup need to demonstrate for it to become a viable service for a global corporate? And this is, this is going to be a very juicy one, I'm sure, and very useful one. So I'm really excited to hear it from you. Thanks so much for the question. I'm really happy to be here. It's always uh, extremely um, exciting to see the vibrant movement in London and the UK. Uh, so, um, but thanks for for the question. Uh, I've been uh, over five years on on boards of. I was on the board of AXA Venture Partners, which is a 450 million euro venture capital fund. Uh, as an LP, I'm now on the advisory board of Future Energy Ventures, which is a 250 million fund. Uh, and of course, you know, the startup world and the corporate world are two very different uh, worlds and cultures. And uh, first of all, a startup needs to have a lot of patience and resilience when they start working with large corporates. Uh, having said that, um, I am absolutely convinced about uh, the combination of these two worlds. And uh, there are many success stories um, how this could work. And uh, fortunately, we have a couple of uh, really great success stories in future energy ventures. So a startup Startup, um, more and more corporates are relying in their uh, innovation and R and D work on the cooperation with startups, on the cooperation with universities, and so a startup can come into the corporate world either as a supplier and has to yeah. go to this procurement process, or as an 
as a portfolio company. And, you know, uh, I've seen both uh, that a company, uh, you know, E.ON, who is a parent of Future Energy Ventures, would look at uh, as a supplier, then got an investment and also the other way around. So the most important point is you have to solve a really big problem of a corporate. Um, and and, and uh, like has been mentioned before by prior, and uh, if you take uh, eSmart, it's one of our portfolio companies based out of Norway they have an AI based software uh, drones who are that are inspecting uh, critical infrastructure instead of helicopters so they're dramatically reducing the cost of inspection maintenance and uh, so they came in as a as a pet pilot uh, to the core business of E.ON. It was um, assessed by the core business of E.ON, not by Future Energy Ventures, but the people who work in the core business. And it was approved and now it's been rolled out um, in the entire German market, uh, which is, you know, E.ON has millions of customers. So uh, working uh, with a corporate has a big advantage of you have a lot of domain expertise. Uh, which a, a classical venture capital doesn't have. And you have, of course, millions of customers, so you can scale fast, but it takes time before before this happens. So definitely patience, resilience, but uh, it does work uh, if you have the right partner uh, with you. Absolutely. Uh, it does feel very glacial uh, as a founder and CEO when you're observing it sort of, you know, just just almost almost moving, but not really moving, but moving. Um, yeah. So I can empathize with a lot of founder CEOs who have who have to work through that, whether it is uh, through strategic investment or it is actually working on uh, on the sales side and creating value. I think the most important thing, if I may add that, is is having a business sponsor who is quite high in the hierarchy and. Uh, that's really important that helps you get through uh, the different hurdles. And so finding the right sponsor um, is definitely key to success. Absolutely. Great, great answer. Um, I'm going to throw a couple of questions out for anyone to pick. So feel free, um, anyone can jump in here um, at this stage. Um, how does a founder work out which funding route is right for their business? Who's got? Well, I, I'm very happy to, to start saying that you know, from my experience, I think it's really important to find um, a var you know, varied investors with different time horizons. And the reason I say that is that a lot of people turn around and want investors for the very long term. But actually, as you grow your business, you don't necessarily as a founder want to dilute yourself. You need other people who are willing to sell their shares and sell their stakes at an earlier stage. You don't want everybody necessarily to be a long-term holder. So the mixture between the institutional investors or the VC investors, or the retail investors, the family office investors, I think becomes very, very important. And I think that's one of the reasons why we support the public market so much, because of course, that's where you get the varied criteria necessary to get the right sort of um, differences between the investors out there. So time horizon for me is very important. That's yeah, the thing I would I add could... is... Gary, go. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. I was going to say, if I could add, what I would say is the first thing is that founders should understand if they have an investable business, because not every business is investable. I think if you look at the numbers, only 0.05% of companies in the US end up getting venture capital funding. So it is really a kind of very limited pool of companies that are eligible for venture. And then I think if you are within that pool, then you need to understand the way the game is played. They're kind of really clear benchmarks as to what you need to have accomplished at each stage and how much money more or less you should be thinking about raising, what sort of percentage you should give away, um, I think it's indexed did a really great uh, you know, study that was focusing on stock options, but there's a chart that they have in it, which is looking at their portfolio companies at each stage, pre-seed, seed, uh, series A, series B, what um, yeah. is a typical round size, what's the maximum valuation, what should you have in terms of traction, et cetera. And I think the first thing is that founders have to know if they're in the game, and secondly, if they're in the game, how the game is played. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting that game changes rules every, you know, every year. <laughs> so 
these these documents um, are super useful, but if, you know, within a year's time, we're seeing larger and larger rounds. So what was seed is now considered, you know, no longer seed. That's potentially pre-seed or Series A. Is, you know, so it's okay. it is very variable based on how we're going along. I have a question for you, actually, Gary. Um, oh, so, unless anybody has anything else to add to that point. I, I did, well, I was just, just going to add one. one Having helped a couple of startups getting angel and pre seed investing, I think the later you do the funding, the better, because it really takes away a lot of attention from operational business. Um, so if you have, you know, private money or friends and family money, it definitely is helpful to push the funding round out as long as possible. Um, as it, you know, it's very hard to do both to, to, to scale your business and, and to do the funding round at the same time. And as you're a small startup, you know, you have to make a choice. You have to focus. Yeah. All I was going to add, Sophia, was that, you know, I think what is really important here is that you don't need to assume you know all the answers. And that's why communities are important. You know, go to your peers, go to advisors, go to people uh, cold to ask for advice and, and get that knowledge that you need to be able to make these sorts of decisions. Um, that's where communities like, you know, Tech London Advocates or Global Tech Advocates can be really transformational because there are so many people in that community who can help you with this stuff. So if you don't know, ask a friend. It's a really, really great way of getting the right information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good one. Um, Gary, I have a question for you. The investor community can seem like a closed shop. It's hard to break into. It's very true. If you don't know investors, how do you connect with the right people? Yeah, no, so I mean, I think, you know, picking up on the earlier conversation, I mean, I really, I hear what you're saying about kind of the rules change somewhat at the edges, but the basics don't really change that much, right? And I think um, I was investing in companies for about 10 years at Wire. We invested in 185 companies. The rules kind of evolve, but they don't fundamentally shift. Um, and I think that for a lot of founders who don't come from, quote unquote, the right backgrounds, that really is the kind of um, main barrier that they face. So if you look, for example, at black founders, black founders in the UK get 0.24% of funding, black women get 0.02. If you look at female founders in the US, I have the numbers in the US, um, it's something like female-led companies received 2.8% approximately of funding in 2019. It went down to about 2.3% in 2020. So the numbers are actually going in the wrong direction. I think a lot of it really is just about kind of the fact that these networks that currently exist are pretty much closed off. They have these kind of rules that exist in any sort of network. They could be somewhat flexible, but if you don't know how the rules work, um, if you don't know the right vocabulary, if you don't know what customer acquisition cost is, even though it's a relatively simple concept, people will use those very simple things to kind of um, you know block you out. There are also kind of other factors like socioeconomic. So in the US, 40% of all VCs went to Harvard and Stanford, throw in Yale, Penn, and, uh, and MIT, it goes to 70%. In the UK, you'd have business schools in Oxford and Cambridge. So it is really kind of a network that exists that mm -hmm. is really has its own self-perpetuating rules. And it's really meant to protect mm -hmm. people who are in the networks. And I think the hard part mm -hmm. is if you're not from the network, what do you do? I think that there are two mm -hmm. elements. Uh, one is that you need to have more funds that are kind of like Priya's, which are led by women investing in women, because what you found is that it tends to be the case that minorities invest in minorities. Like the people who are not from those backgrounds generally tend to think of uh, investing in minorities and women as a higher risk profile. And they think that their investments are kind of risky enough, no need to add an additional factor of risk. And I think the yeah. second thing is the social capital bit, helping people to understand, well, if you don't understand the way the game is played, you know, just like Serena Williams probably didn't come from the right background to play tennis, but at the end of the day, yeah. she got a coach and she figured out and she became the greatest of all time. A lot of times these rules are not very impenetrable. You just need someone to take the time to help you understand them. Yeah, great, great answer. Um, okay, free for all question. There is a growing attention and interest in circular economy and sustainable startups. Do you expect to see investment grow in this sector? Bit of a leading question, but. Well, I'll, I'll jump into it. And the answer is yes, then. Um, it's a leading question, and the answer is yes. I mean, <laughs> obviously, entrepreneurship is about kind of. <laughs> Entrepreneurship is about solving big problems. This is obviously a very big problem. So there's going to be money and people with big brains dedicated to solving this very big problem. Yeah, 
And what's great is we're finally here. I mean, what do you feel has spurned it on? Um, you know, I, I don't want to blow trumpets, but you know, the clean tech companies have been around for a long time. Um, but what has, in your mind, really awakened the investment community to it? Because that's what we're starting to see as a slight shift. I think there, there's a generational change. If you look at the online brokers today, the average age is in their mid-20s. And therefore, um, things of ESG is really personal and important. And I think uh, if you look at the traditional ways, going back to Gary's point, it's a traditional way of, of, of where equities used to be a privilege. Uh, you know, it's all moved on and the paradigm has shifted here. And therefore, the very good news is we are actually seeing real reaction and real response from businesses. And there's no doubt. I mean, it is a leading question. Of course, the answer is yes. And you can see that from the investment community that is, has a very strong appetite. I think the danger here, of course, is that there's a strong appetite, meaning there's a lot of money out there, that we've also got to be careful that there aren't so many companies coming in pretending they're involved in some of this business in some way. In other words, putting presentations forward and business plans forwards and trying to raise money simply because they've used various words that they think investors will be interested in. And that's yeah. the danger. You know, th it is yeah. great to see this change, but I think one also has to be cautious. Yeah. There, I think there's also a, a real opportunity that's, that's coming through at the moment, Safia, which is an alignment between um, the policy climate and where there is appetite amongst investors. Um, there is a huge, you know, global, um, focus with Glasgow obviously happening this year, but also, you know, another, uh, the US administration aligning with many other administrations about what we need to do next. Um, and that coupled with the business appetite we're seeing from investors and indeed some government funding to support that process. I mean, even just today, the UK government announced a three million program to have um, zero emissions infrastructure for jet um, travel. So, you know, there are some really exciting policy and investment alignments that I think creating I new one, opportunities one, that one, weren't there historically. Got it. And if I may add to that from a corporate perspective, um, you know, more than 20% of corporates have signed a net zero agreement and especially the financial sector has you know, has woken up, I would say, sitting on the board of, of one of the largest insurers who have very long balance sheet. Uh, they want to de-risk their assets. And so ESG is definitely uh, not a hobby. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely at the core of the strategy because it's about risk. You know, you, you, you yeah. um, don't want to have the wrong investments into current uh, industries or, or things. Uh, and, and they have a very long-term focus. Um, and so I can definitely say in the course of the past five years, just five years, I can see um, that this is becoming really serious and um, consumers are demanding it. It's, uh, but also uh, risk, risk profiles are demanding it to, 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 to really uh, focus on ESG. And uh, so I'm, I'm rather optimistic. Um, you know, uh, there's been a great report of the International Energy Agency a couple of weeks ago who said, you know, we can still make it uh, net zero by 2050 if we scale the existing uh, innovation and technology for the next 10 years. But then after that, those 10 years, we need new technologies. So uh, we also need the venture capital industries. And I'm, I'm so happy to see this movement here because, you know, we the technologies we need um, after the next decade hasn't been, you know, it's not there yet. So uh, we're all in this together. I think it's a global movement. Um, I think Europe can take, you know, a lead here. And uh, it's been, and of course also, you know, the pandemic has, has helped. Um, and I, I see a great, great increase in awareness uh, on the sustainability issue. Excellent. Carla? Thanks for closing it for me. Those are great words. I don't have anything further to add to that. I think you wrapped it up beautifully. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for a great session. Hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. And please enjoy thank the rest you. of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Well, my huge thanks to all of our guests today, including our chair for that last session, Safia Qureshi, her company, by the way, Cup Club, cupclub.com. Go and have a look and support it if you can. Uh, you as a viewer might be shouting at your screen today, net zero's not enough, off settings, not enough. We need to go net negative to be continued. Let's keep talking and let's keep sharing using the hashtag GTA Investor Showcase. So our next panel looks specifically at the mobility sector. We've hinted about it a bit before, but we've all seen the e-scooters being trialled across London. And whilst it's still, I'll be honest, a bit of a novelty here in London, this is clearly a growth sector where lots of European cities have arguably taken a lead on the UK. So what are we talking about? Electric bikes, e-scooters, electric skateboards, and electric cars. Well, they've all exploded across Europe and urban mobility innovation is finding new solutions clearly to public transport. So here to discuss this emerging sector and its environmental implications, our panel. Now we're going to introduce them very quickly. Jan Lozek is the second managing partner we've welcomed today from the Future Energy Ventures. It's Berlin-based uh, venture arm of E.ON. Welcome, Jan. Lovely to see you. Uh, Gavin Poole joins us again. Hello again, Gavin, Chief Executive here East. I'm looking forward to hearing all about the first e-scooter trial in the UK, which was held right here at Here East. Emily Brooke, how are you, Emily? Nice to see you. <laughs> I haven't seen you in 2D or 3D for a long time, Ollie. I know, Hello. it's terrible. It's <laughs> nice to see you. You're the founder and chair of Beryl, and you're a partner at Revent VC, which aims to get more people on bikes across cities. And we'll have a quick reminder about what all these good things involve. Beryl, of course, famous for its initial laser light and has gone way beyond that now. It's fantastic. Uh, joining us virtually as well, we have UC Palola, the co-founder and CEO of Virta. Now, Virta is an electric vehicle charging platform based in Helsinki. What a finish. Welcome, Yussi. How are you? Very good to see you all. By the way, the pictures are going uh, vice versa with, with John. <laughs> so I'm Yussi. <laughs> yes, well, Yussi, it's lovely to see you. Just remind us about Virta. You, you are providing the infrastructure that will help us all charge up our electric vehicles. Have I got that right? You very well right. I, we, I would say that we are the SAP of EV charging business because there's lots of transaction behind the scene. When the car is driving, they are charging in multiple locations and digital platform is the key to manage the process, make it a business and make it affluent. That is our core. Very good and very succinct. Um, Emily Brooke, remind us in a nutshell, tell us about Beryl. You're doing fantastic things. Uh, so, yeah, Beryl is the UK's leading micromobility company. Um, we started off with the laser, as you, as you mentioned, which is my university project. But today we operate and own our own fleets of bikes, electric bikes, electric scooters and electric cargo bikes in seven cities in the UK. And we just won the biggest contract, which is for Greater Manchester. Fantastic. No, congratulations on that. Andy Burnham will be very happy to welcome you. Um, <laughs> why don't we get a quick reminder from you, Jan, for someone just tuning in. Eon Ventures are backing your platform, but you're investing in companies. Are you powering them in other ways? What's your interest in this mobility space then? Yeah, and, and, and thanks for asking. We are investing into the future energy system, and the future energy system is something which will be part uh, of the also um, be connected to the mobility in future. Um, so hence, we are looking at, into a lot of amazing uh, technologies like we are invest in Verta and hi, hi, Yussi, how are you today? Um, and, and a couple of other companies which play in the uh, mobility space. And I think and from, from our perspective, the exciting part is how we connect everything together and, 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 and take the benefits from all this moving batteries, so to say, or this moving storages, yeah. and, and to create a holistic net zero carbon um, energy system in future. Got it, right. So I might quiz you about your relationship a bit more in a minute. I've got some questions for you individually, and then we've got an all play round, like a quiz round, where you can put your hand up for me. Let's start with e-scooters. Gavin, let's just be honest, there's been a little bit of a backlash about their safety in cities. So give us the candid feedback. Are these sort of newer mobility solutions always a good thing? Um, well, that's a great question. I, I, from an e-scooter perspective, there's lots of other solutions out there and go, okay, it's probably on the edge for um, paper use or uh, general mode of, of commuting. 
On the e-scooter question, mm -hmm. I think undoubtedly it is a massive success. There's always going to be naysay naysayers when you're introducing new forms of transport into a system which is already predetermined to be set up for motor vehicles. Mm -hmm. So I think the e-scooters actually fulfill a very, very um, uh, clear definition of what it is for the first and last mile um, uh, solution. Is it to get from me from southwest London to here at here east? No. At the beginning and at the end, absolutely. A lot of the complaints are about the paper use, you know, where they parked, are they just dumped on the corners? You know, we all, many of us have been to South by Southwest, when we saw them all piled up around in Austin, there was a big backlash. I think with careful management and responsible operation, not only by the operators, but also by the members of public as well, which is an education piece, it can work, and it can work really, really well. Okay, so a note of optimism from Gavin Poole. My point to you about e-scooters, Gavin, would be, it's just very confusing. Where are they allowed to go? Do they have to have one thing or another? Do we need more clarity about I think what's we do need, need new clarity, but actually, I think it could be very, very simply sorted, which is don't ride on pavements, get them on the roads. Yeah. They can go in the cycle lanes, but that's already heavily congested anyway. Ah. So just get them legislated out onto the roadways and it will be fine. If people, like you can ride a bike on the roadway, It'd be absolutely fine, but people need to be sensible. OK, well, you'll all have views on this, including you uh, tuning in. Jan, let's ask a broader question about Europe. We're good at blowing our own trumpet here in London. But let's be honest, why are, do you think, Jan, why are micro-mobility solutions so popular across Europe when we've seen relatively low uptake in the UK? And you can feel free to be as blunt as you like, Jan. Yeah, uh, a very good question. Um, um, yeah, m maybe um, it's 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 part of regulation. So um, and then and a lot of these micro mobility startups um, were picking up in, in European countries earlier, um, and 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 um, that that may be uh, the biggest sources. And and um, I mean it's obviously a question of customers if they are prepared, would like to use it. And if you look look um, um, into the transportation system in the UK, there may be some differences. Don't want it to judge here. So, um, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question and happy also to get the insi insights from, from my panelists. Yeah, good. Uh, well, they, they will join us uh, as we go. Jan, by the way, if you're going to take us to the, um, you know, my, uh, mobility sort of uh, nirvana, if you like, where's leading the pack? Where is the smartest mobile city in the world? Yeah, it's a very good question. I'm, we are always looking into Asia. I think this this, this uh, immense uh, uh, cities uh, with a quite advanced transportation system as such, and also using then micro mobility yeah. uh, solutions there. But um, honestly, um, our our sweet spot is not really the the hardware technology and the mi micro mobility system. It's more the software and the technology to incorporate that into a bigger system and. And, and, and employing smart charging systems, um, connecting mobility to the, to the energy system, and so on yeah. and so forth. So um, happy also uh, to discuss that further with my colleagues here. Right, so, so I'm gonna sort of scatter lots of seeds as we go. Bikes, can we talk about bikes? Emily Brooke, if you were all powerful, <laughs> I sometimes think you are all powerful actually, um, how would you make our cities safer for bikes? And can, can you be sort of specific and practical as you like? Um, yeah, well, it's all—it's the obvious. It's about space. It's, it's providing space for bikes um, to have their own separated, ideally segregated cycle lanes. But it's—it's it's, it's not as difficult as we think. You know, if you look back May 2020, the world stopped still for a second, and you saw people stepped out into the streets to bike, to walk, the kids to play. There was, there was, you know, our, our cities have these huge concrete arteries running through them that are made for cars. Um, but a car takes 1.6 per people on average, and it's a ton of metal. Um, and those arteries could be could be separated in new bikes, uh, and you know, enable cleaner, um, greener, more active, healthier travel for everybody. Yeah, no, it's it's a very very clear vision. I wonder, you see, yeah, you're a visionary entrepreneur. I mean. E-vehicles have got this huge potential for reducing environmental impact. Can, can you give us the sort of big picture sense of the roadmap for replacing all cars with electric vehicles on our roads? What, what should we bear in mind? The most really essential thing is the combination with the energy system. Not, uh, the, the electric vehicles are not changing the fuel of the vehicle, but it is actually integrating the power, power system. And why this is essential is that the power system is changing at the same time to renewable electricity production more. This requires 
balancing power in order to increase the global level of, of renewable electricity uh, from solar and wind. Electric vehicles are the single most important new element in the power system. So this is not only changing the fuel, but actually giving support for sustainable energy system. And, and, and we, we see practice how, how we work that, that the combination of flexibility. Actually, in the UK, we have a really advanced uh, uh, commercial uh, project with the uh, uh, national grid, E.ON and Nissan uh, and Cenex uh, with, with vehicle to grid, where the vehicles are giving uh, support for the power grid. So this is, I would say, in the nutshell, the best parts of the electric mobility. It's support to change to sustainable energy. Yeah, understood. And just in terms of those deadlines and timelines saying all fossil fuel power vehicles out, electric vehicles in, just give us a reminder of the roadmap across Europe, because I want to understand where everybody sits on that. This is a really good question. Uh, so uh, during spring, all the, let's say, forecast houses changes their prediction. For example, Bloomberg uh, changed uh, that Europe uh, 40 percent sales of electric vehicle uh, during 2030 to 80 uh, percent and, and this is a uh, due to the change that the, now the national policies the green policies are pushing forward so I would say Europe will be the first continent uh, to reach this kind of let's say almost uh, almost there and, and 100 percent is, is not uh, the visible measure but let's say we are getting to 90 percent, uh, and, and that is, we, we are talking about uh, the uh, 2030, 2040 period of time where we where we where we hit the, let's say the majority part will yep. be is changed. All right, thank you, Yussi. Emily, very briefly, you set out to raise money for a hardware. Can you believe it? A hardware business, <laughs> and uh, you know it, maybe it was an uphill struggle, maybe it wasn't. But any sense that that particular endeavour has got easier in the years that have passed? Um, a little bit, I think. I mean, having a software element to it as well is obviously very, very important. Um, we, we, we provide software, for example, to TfL, to Transport West Midlands. We provide all the tracking and software and platform that enables them to track their assets and their bikes and their vehicles. Um, hardware, uh, hardware, but it also builds defensibility. I think people are realizing that with some enormous companies that have physical products are often the most valuable. Yeah. Um, well, I wish we had much longer with all of you, but Gavin, can I go back to sort of vision, if you like? I mean, here is nothing if it's not a sort of attractor for visionaries, right? Give us a sense of where you think this whole space is going to move, particularly over the sort of medium term. It's all very well to focus on the next couple of years, but give us your view of the bigger picture. I think the whole, um, the focus we just on the last panel about ESG investment is absolutely so. Investors, sophisticated investors, and the general public are wanting to see a more of a greater move to this. Climate change is one of the most important things on people's long range strategic radar, as opposed to you know what's going on with the children or their schools or healthcare. So I think that's super important. Greater uh, expansion of the electric uh, vehicle network of charging system. Um, making sure that people are confident if they are going to um, acquire a car, which are quite high value at the moment, the price is coming down, they are going to be able to use that around the country and not yeah. around urban hotspots. Um, but I think it's just going to get more and more and more. As everybody's looking towards, you know, what car am I going to get? The second-hand car market will start to expand as well. Um, are we going to be able to get battery replacements and so on and so forth? Yeah. So that's what I think it's all leading to, which is greater expansion of the whole vehicle network. Yeah, now we, we have to close the panel, but you see, I can't resist asking you, given we've got Jan on the line, what's your top tip for an entrepreneur to have a healthy and brilliant relationship with their investor? I think uh, to bring good numbers in the growth, <laughs> that is the best way, And uh, We've been successful uh, and, and Financial Times ranked us one of the fastest growing company. So bringing external merit is quite a good part. Yeah, no, fair enough. Well, we will leave it there. I know you'll each have your own tips. But to all of our panelists, uh, especially to Gavin Poole here in the studio, thank you so much for joining me. I wish we had a bit longer. Uh, we're going to be back with our final session in just a few moments' time.
Well, welcome back. And on behalf of the Global Tech Advocates and Tech London Advocates, a very warm welcome to this Investor Showcase 3.0. I'm Ollie Barrett, your MC, your compere, here in our Heary studio in London. And it's very good of you to join us. Our final session, uh, well, I hope you've got your traveling shoes on because we have gathered together the leads of the Global Tech Advocates, uh, particularly across Europe. So. One thing to note, each of our speakers is emulating what Russ Shaw created here in London, uh, championing their local tech ecosystems in Europe's fastest growing tech cities and regions. And hopefully we can see some of our guests as they join us. We've got the brilliant Naomi Timperley from Tech North Advocates. I'm going to give you all a very big wave. We've got Teresa Martin from Tech Spain Advocates. Hello, Teresa. Thank you so much. Buongiorno. Hello, uh, thank Oli. you for joining Good us. To see you again. It's lovely to see you again. Esther O'Callaghan from Tech Netherlands Advocates. Welcome, Esther. Anders Nielsen from Tech Italy Advocates. Uh, Jeanette Carlson from Tech Nordic Advocates. And uh, welcome, Jeanette. Uh, Matthias Engel from Tech Berlin Advocates. Valentin Pellissier from Tech France Advocates. And finally, here in the Hello. studio, Andrew Robel, founding partner of Emerging Europe Tech EE Advocates. Well, I must start with you, Andrew. How nice to see you. Well, it's great to be here, to be taking part in a sort of live event to some extent. Yeah, it's great to be face to face. And um, uh, emerging Europe, that covers many countries. Just help us get our heads around it. Yes, uh, so uh, I would say the, the, the region is actually the biggest among all the uh, you know, uh, locations that GTA covers. But we need to make a small distinction between emerging Europe and uh, tech emerging Europe advocates. So uh, emerging Europe covers 23 countries, wow. while the you know, um, uh, Tech Emerging Europe Advocates covers uh, 25 countries. Got it. Well, well, you've got your work cut out for you in any case. Now, we're going to do a bit of a whistle stop. Um, I want to try and avoid this feeling like Eurovision. Uh, so don't worry, no one's going to be given nul point. Um, and we're going to go through the GTA <laughs> network. And I guarantee that we could spend an hour with each of these guests. But today, we're going to get their super flashy update on really three particular things. And panel, thank you already for being so uh, concise and succinct. I want to know an emerging trend, uh, particularly around tech for net zero in your country or region that we should be aware of. I want to hear a snippet of what you're hearing from investors about growth opportunities. And if you've still got time in your final 10 seconds, I want to know the biggest challenge that you think local startups face. So Naomi Timpley hasn't let me down in 10 years. I think I'm going to start with you, Naomi, from Tech North Advocates. When you're ready, off you go. Okay, hi. So um, I obviously represent the North, but I live in Manchester, so I'm just going to talk a, a little bit about what's going on in Manchester. Um, we have a number of things that we're doing. So there's a lot of um, university-led um, innovation going on. And we actually have a, a university-led uh, energy agency, uh, which is all about turning Greater Manchester Green. Mm. Um, so there is, um, this is all about kickstarting a decade of clean energy innovation to meet the region's 2038 carbon neutral target. Um, I also uh, wanted to also point out that there is also um, at the University of Salford, for example, um, they have uh, two energy houses. Uh, where you can actually um, test and, you know, it's all very much around research, um, focusing on energy use in the UK. Um, some brilliant companies uh, um, that I've, I've had the great pleasure of working with, um, to name but a few, Republic of Things are working with councils around, uh, and housing associations around um, energy consumption in homes, but also um, making sure um, that they can um, also monitor the health and well-being of, yeah. of the tenants. Um, just really quickly, um, just want to quickly mention a, a recent report that Brabner's and um, White Cap Consulting um, just did um, with regards to um, innovation uh, funding or Northwest tech funding in, in, in the Northwest in particular. Um, it's, it's still um, very difficult um, for, for businesses in the North to get funding. Um, it's not as easily read, readily available as it is in perhaps London or other cities in, in Europe. Um, but I, what I will say is, is um, you know, th there's lots of things happening um, and, and I would definitely say that the, um, 
you know, the startup community um, in the north, mm. uh, you know, obviously including the wider north, not just Manchester, yeah. um, it is very vibrant at the moment. If I had to say really specifically, was it all about, you know, what we're talking about today? No. But what I will say is, is, is purpose... Um, and it comes in into into mind a lot with a lot of the, the startups that I'm working with, um, and also, um, you know, I think definitely um, innovations around um, you know energy and uh, and power are things that I've seen a lot of. All right, thank you, Naomi. Thank you so much for that. Well, that's the clarion call to investors: get up to Euston, get on a train to Manchester, and start investigating. Next up, it's only uh, two hours. <laughs> Matthias, Matthias Engel, uh, coming to us from Tech Berlin Advocates. Uh, be as pithy as you can, Matthias. Tell us what you see. Well, hi. Thanks for having me. Um, Matthias here uh, from, from Berlin. Um, well, basically, I must say what I see is a number of, and I'm an angel investor right now, so just to make that clear. So I have a pretty good overview, I think, on deal flow coming, coming in as an angel investor. I must say what I have noticed recently is quite a few initiatives by founders that are coming out of universities with a great tech mind. Um, and so I think that's something really that we need to follow because I think ultimately for net zero, tech will matter. Um, and so therefore, uh, I think investors should really get easier in investing in, in deep tech tech founders. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. An area, I mean, pretty broad, I, I would say that at least here in Berlin, the ecosystem, I think many verticals are being addressed by, by new founders. So, so be it mobility or energy. But what I also noticed recently quite as a trend on buildings and prop tech and housing, and also I think in an area that you know is quite undercovered yet. Yeah. In terms of challenges for um, I think founders, um, well, I mean I think it is finding the right investors, especially if you're in clean tech. And I think we, we heard about that in, in earlier discussions. It's about patient capital. I think you need to find investors that really understand tech. And I mean, looking at some of the you know, you know, VCs out there, um, I think they need to get comfortable because they need yeah. deeper pockets. They need a bit more breath, sort of, and that patient capital attitude because, you know, clean tech, as the name already says, involves technology. Yeah. Um, and you have to have a good understanding uh, before you invest. Um, and I think we need more investors that really have a profound knowledge of, of the technology. So that's one challenge, I think, for founders. Number two, okay, still well, that Matthias, Matthias, well. Matthias, 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 we're just going to have to, I think, well, tell us very briefly what your number two is, and then I'm afraid we must move on. But I want to hear it in a nutshell, Okay, please. now, number two is, is sales, as always. You're getting that traction, um, especially if you're selling to an old economy. They need to find yeah. the right people that can actually do the sales. Got it. That's it. Really clear. Thank you. Uh, let's head over to sunny Spain. Teresa Martin, lovely to see you. Tell us what you're seeing. Thank you, Oli, and thank you, everybody. Um, let me give you those three answers that you just asked for. Um, one of the main trends that we are uh, viewing here in Spain is uh, the blue economy uh, that I'm surprised not to have heard of much during this afternoon. Uh, the blue, blue economy intends um, um, to um, use our oceans in a more uh, sustainable way. Um, as you know, Spain has one of the largest coast lines in, in, in the European Union, and it, it is a priority here to yeah. improve the state of the, of the um, um, oceans and to make, it, make um, fishing and farming of algae uh, more uh, sustainable and more profitable. That was one of the, the trends that I wanted to identify. Mm. Secondly, I'm going to give you three figures, which are very impressive and I want to put into context. 130 billion uh, pounds sterling are going to be released into the Spanish economy uh, by way of uh, the next generation um, European funds. And those have to be allocated and 40%, which is my second figure, 40% of those 130 billion great British pounds are going to be allocated to uh, the areas of green transformation and digital transformation. So if you put them, those two together, uh, you can see there is 
huge um, amount of money mm -hmm. to be um, devoted to net zero economy and the digitalization of business. And finally, the third figure is 46 million. There are 46 million um, in people in, living in Spain um, and, there, and investing in Spain uh, allows you to, the possibility to access in that market. Yeah. Um, the biggest challenge to continue with your questions for, for the Spanish startups and businesses is um, the biggest challenge is the lack of financing. That this is a, a permanent problem here in Spain that, uh, that we hope will be addressed by these next generation funds. Uh -huh. uh, and, and in that sense, uh, bear in mind that never 100% of the funding is available through these funds. There's always the need for a uh, private funding yeah. alongside. So Got it. welcome Sp to Spain if you wish to, to do great investments in the green economy and the blue economy. No, very good. Well, Spain is open. What's that? España está abierto. We're very, very much appreciated. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Why don't we go to the Netherlands? Um, Esther O'Callaghan, tell us your answers. Uh, so, the, um, in terms of emerging trends, um, there's two two main aspects that I'm interested. I think are exciting, um, and I think it's kind of how the Netherlands operates in terms of having um, a very very globalised international approach. And um, so, the European Hyperloop Centre is here, uh, which is one of my favourite uh, things. Looking at 10,000 kilometre Hyperloop, um, which will achieve zero. Um, CO2 in terms of replacing short haul flights, which I really hope happens in my lifetime because uh, I, I want to go on it. Um, so that's uh, that's one of them. Um, and then agri-food um, is a huge industry um, here. I'm not going to embarrass myself. It's not my area of expertise. Um, but again, um, the plant-based foods, global center of excellence from a, a Swedish um, Denmark-based um, business have kind of relocated here um, and there's a lot of accelerators um, in that space. Uh, people like Rockstar, um, Haughty Heroes, Yes Delft. Um, so that's the, the kind of the general landscape. Um, you see a lot of public-private partnerships here with strong R&D um, academic, from academic institutions. Um, so like Utrecht, you know, Delft universities, uh, Tech Leap, obviously is the main um, government um, fund for scale-ups. In terms of challenge, um, I think it's risk and timeframes uh, pushing out a huge amount of new technology uh, to address a really urgent global problem. And I think, uh, similar to Berlin, um, I think patient capital is important. And I think we're going to need to see more innovation, not just on the startup scale-up side, but in terms of how VCs and funders fund this sector in a sustainable way, um, because that can be at odds with fund ROI demands. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much, Esther, from uh, Tech Netherlands Advocates. So we've had the blue economy, we've had the Hyperloop. Uh, right, the bar is already high. As we go to Italy, Tech Italy Advocates, Anders, welcome. Tell us what you see in Italy. Thank you. Yes, the, the trends in Italy, they span across all the areas from agri-food, fashion, and, and into the energy sector, etc. There are also incentives from the Italian government, and there are more to come in the future. But one that started already a year ago, before the pandemic hit, was about how to improve the uh, insulation and renovation of, of both apartments, houses, and, and offices. Since Italy is kind of a lot of old buildings, so there could be huge savings to be made. So there is an incentive program called 110, and that has already given some benefits to some startups. There's one startup called Rice House that produce paint, plaster, and insulation material from the, the um, byproducts when you produce rice. Mm. So they take what you don't eat of the rice to, to do this construction material. And that's interesting because, of course, the in construction sector is kind of late laggards on, on the innovation in, in general. So I think it's interesting to see that also governmental incentives that are maybe coming uh -huh. out now also post-COVID could help to accelerate some of these, these uh, opportunities for startups Gosh, in that... different, different sectors. No, that's fascinating. And, Very uh, interesting. Carry on, carry on. Yeah, so for the investment side, I think also Italy, I mean, the largest financial institution, the, the Intesa San Paolo Bank, they already la launched three years ago together with the McKellen, Ellen MacArthur Foundation from the US on circular economy, a global program for how to help both larger corporations and startups 
to innovate on the circular economy. Mm. So I think Italy has been an early adapter for once of, of new areas, and it still then, of course, have to prove how much financing can be added uh, locally to the startups. Because I think it's not only the financing. I think also Italian startups like Rice House, they now trying to look for new markets for construction yes. materials. So how could they sell and expand outside Italy? So I think that's very good. No, thank you, Anders, for that. Global Tech Advertic Gets can help out. Thank, thank you. you for that. Just look out on those government incentives for insulation that your government doesn't change their mind <laughs> halfway through. That has happened in some countries, I gather. Andrew, here in the studio, tell us what you see across 25 different countries. That's going to be interesting. Uh, well, that's that's a challenge in itself, I, I would have to say. But uh, no, there, there's obviously a, a lot of um, different different trends happening in the region, from circular uh, circular economy to uh, you know immobility that we obviously have to talk about. But uh, the thing that I would focus on would be the quality of air or air pollution that has been you know both a challenge for the region because the region has actually been one of the most polluted regions in Europe, but also uh, an opportunity for some startups. And there's, there's startups like Early, like Pure Cloud that has been growing you know, for quite some time. And I think the other thing that I would focus on would be ESG in general. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, perhaps the region has been neglecting that part of, you know, of, of, of business, sort of. But it seems that recently has that has become very very important and uh, we even have one country that uh, released its own uh, ESG report and that's Uzbekistan this is something that we would not really expect Wow I wonder if we'll ever see a company or a country commit to being uh, net negative in the same way huge organizations have net zero might not be enough but we already see uh, companies reducing you know uh, or challenging the uh, the um, the quotas that uh, you know other countries yes. have, or, or even the EU have uh, put out there, uh, like North Macedonia even recently doing that, and some regions in Poland. Yeah, how, how fascinating that you mentioned air pollution. It could be one of those bridging concepts between human health and planetary health. Yes, Indeed. especially recently with, obviously, the pandemic. For sure. Andrew Robel, thank you for being here in the studio, and uh, I look forward to a proper refreshing uh, <laughs> reflection with you afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, let's jump on another sort of uh, into our time machine again. Why don't we go to Jeanette uh, Carlson from Tech Nordic Advocates. Jeanette, always interesting to hear what you see. Fantastic. Good evening, London from Copenhagen. Now, that did sound like the Eurovision Sun Contest. I apologise. Um, <laughs> so, as you know, we in Tech Nordic Advocates uh, represent the five Nordic and the three Baltic countries, so eight countries in, in, uh, in total. So, obviously, a bit of variation of the same theme. But, uh, but I think without boasting too much, um, Oli, I think it's fair to say that, that the Nordic region have been leading the race yeah. for carbon neutrality, neutrality for decades now, um, blending really our natural environment with uh, very specific and highly ambitious climate change initiatives, uh, engineering and innovative technologies just to, to, to end on tech. Uh, and and I, that really goes for pretty much anything we touch, whether it's the energy transition, whether it's fashion, whether it's furniture, it's the key word is sustainability in everything we do, pretty much. Um, and and I think what has characterised us, and you know, you're asking for a trend. Um, you know, I think the Nordics are prime example of, you know, what we talk about as kind of triple helix partnerships, the way in which the private and public sectors and universities. Uh, educational institutions have come together yeah. and and you know and developed innovative solutions a bit like Esther was talking about in the Netherlands yeah. uh, that that is absolutely huge the way in which that the different parts of society have come together and of course with startups uh, as well yeah. so that's really important I think another key trend um, or Oli is the way in which we in the Nordics and Baltics too are very much associated with the green uh, transition in the eyes of investors. They absolutely come to the Nordics uh, expecting to find interesting startups to invest in that are top of their game as far as sustainability and, and green transition is concerned. So it is just a brand out there that sustainability, green energy, carbon neutrality, the race towards all of those things. Yeah. 
equals Nordics and yeah. Baltics. So I think that's really important yeah. uh, to to highlight. And of course, that gives us a lot to live up to. But but I yeah. I think we I think we are living up to it. Yeah. I think in terms of challenges, just super quickly. Um, and it's been mentioned a, a couple of times before uh, is access to capital is mm. it's it, you know it, it barely uh, you know is worth mentioning now because it, it's just so obvious but, but I think if we were to be a little bit specific I think where where we have got a lot better is around the kind of seed early stage um, sort of access to kind of risk capital let's, let's call it that what is really hard is the growth capital end of things mm. um and that's where international investors come in and that's something we're working really hard on and that's how the, the gta network obviously is very important in london silicon valley you know canada you know etc it's yep. it's a growth capital stage thank you uh, and in addition to you know access to capital it's about you know know how it's yep. not about finding uh, a startup necessarily it is when you come to scaling uh, because we haven't had, you know, a huge number of Facebooks and Googles and Amazons from here, you know, it is in the lack of uh, understanding experience of how to scale yeah. uh, tech companies globally. And, and that's important. And that's why for both of those reasons, being part of a, a, of a global hub is absolutely you know, key. To Good. Success. Well, that is exactly what the Global Tech Advocates is all about, that exchange. Uh, thank you, Jeanette Carlson. Uh, by no means least, uh, Valentin Pellissier from France. Uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Bonsoir from Paris. Um, well, I want to actually share uh, with you a, a great Tech for Net Zero story, a concrete story, uh, that shows how much there is a potential in uh, new sources of energy here in France, uh, as much as there are challenges. Uh, it's the story of life. Uh, no joking, LHYFE, which is a, uh, an amazing company um, that is a pioneer in the industrial and clean production of hydrogen uh, for uh, the, uh, the production of uh, batteries for vehicles. Um, they are at the moment build, building their first uh, facility in the southwest of France. Um, and its founder uh, comes from France's world-class uh, scientific institutions. Mm. Uh, and here's a first uh, thing, you know, in France we tend to say that uh, it's the exception uh, that confirms the rule, meaning that uh, one of the first challenges that I want to talk about here is that we need to have more um, spin-off from our, our amazing scientific and academic institutions, yeah. um, making more life uh, stories. Um, and second um, is the fact that uh, LIFE uh, actually raised 10 million euros, uh, which is great, but sounds actually a little bit ridiculous compared to uh, what we see in other countries, uh, yeah. especially the US or the UK, or also compared to what we see and what we've seen in France with companies uh, that raised 300 or 400 million euros and that could not care less, let's be honest, uh, uh, with uh, Tech for Net Zero. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, this, this challenge is the access for, to funds. Um, French startups have actually raised uh, 5.4 billion um, euros last year, uh, which is amazing. And me and the team, we've looked at the next 40 index, which is the main 40 startups in France uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, out of these 40 companies, only five actually have a product or a service that is, let's say, tech for net zero friendly. Mm. Um, so I think we need to, to talk about the fact that um, there should be more responsibility uh, within your investors to, uh, to uh, direct funds towards, um, you know, greener and cleaner uh, companies. Yeah, we absolutely do. Valentin Pellissier, thank you so much. And uh, lovely to hear from the gendarmerie uh, going strong over there in Paris. So thank you so much uh, for that. Speaking of which, the siren call of our final uh, speeches is calling to me. Now, so let me just say, firstly, of course, a thank you today uh, to all of our guests from across Europe. But um, on a more serious and longer term note, thank you to the leaders who have all just spoken for your service and your commitment and your investment of time and energy and generosity. It's massively appreciated by our whole Global Tech Advocates community. And I know that everyone involved with today would echo that thought. So thank you to you all, wherever you've been tuned in from. Well, we're going to be back for this Investor Showcase final thoughts from our founder in just a few moments' time. Guys, it's been a pleasure.
here we are in the studio for our Investor Showcase 3.0. And I should say uh, the word reaches me, and perhaps we might touch on this in our final thoughts, that Tech Berlin Advocates has recently launched, is about to launch. Am I absolutely right there, Russ? Coming soon. Coming it's very coming soon, soon with ah. Matthias as co-lead. Ah, we'll watch this space. Well, speaking of final thoughts, it's my great honor to turn to the founder of Tech London Advocates, the founder of Global Tech Advocates, for a final reflection reflection on today, and that is, of course, to Russ Shaw. Thank you so much, Ali. Fabulous job today. Hello, advocates. Um, thank you for being with us today, and I really hope you feel inspired to take action and implement change based upon what you've heard. I agree with the investors who've shared their view that Tech for Net Zero is one of the biggest growth opportunities for tech entrepreneurs across Europe and with a purpose to help the planet. Um, thank you again to Here East, Future Energy Ventures, and Bohurst for your support and generosity today. Thank you to our annual partners, Sue Smiths, Credit Suisse, Lake Star, His Cox, Russell Reynolds, Globalization Partners, Pennington's Manchester Cooper, and our GTA partners, HP and KPMG. And thank you to all of our speakers, moderators, and of course to Ali for a bit of a marathon three-hour session. Um, and thank you to all of our GTA leads, who, many of whom you just were able to see with us today. And yes, we will be launching Tech Berlin Advocates in the not-too-distant future with Matthias Engel as the lead of that group. Um, now, I'd like to share some important announcements before we, go, we bring the Investor Showcase to a close. On the 15th of July, we will be launching Tech Wales Advocates, which will be our fifth network in the UK. This group will be led by Nathan Stockford and Mark John, and the event will take place at Capital Tower in Cardiff. Tech India Advocates and Tech Peru Advocates are up and running, and will have formal launches in the coming months as they navigate the pandemic impact in their respective countries. Tech Australia Advocates will launch later in the summer, and groups in Korea, Nanjing and China, the UAE, and Berlin, as I've mentioned, will launch later in the year. Now, I did warn you that global domination was part of our aim. London Tech Week is fast approaching now in its eighth year, and London, Tech London Advocates has been there right from the start and is a co-founding partner along with Informatech and London and Partners. The week kicks off on the 20th of September, and we will host a TLA and GTA event on that Monday the 20th. Then, our plan is to host another GTA summit and festival in China, focusing on Tech for Net Zero and building on the success of our event there back in 2019 when we went to Beijing and Shanghai. Our hope is to do that in spring 2022, and advocates from all GTA networks will be invited to join us, and we'll share more details with you when we have them. Thank you for joining Investor Showcase 3.0, and I hope to see many of you in person very soon, and please do get involved with London Tech Week. We champion, we connect, we support, and our journey continues. Thank you, and back to you, Ollie. Thank you, Russ. Our journey does continue. And by the way, there's a lot of dates there. I need to get my diary out. <laughs> Please do. There's a lot going on this year. <laughs> and more global than ever. Um, yeah. Can I ask you a question, Russ? You've been tuned in for this whole event. What, what struck you most of all as you sat there? You're in here in the studio, but you're also watching online. What, what, is it, what hit you? Well, first of all, there's a lot to take in on Tech for Net Zero and the breadth and diversity of the topics that we covered was incredible. But there was, I think, a lot of consistency about the importance that the investors are putting into this space, looking at climate tech, circular economy, sustainability, and giving access to growth capital. So I think it's pause for optimism that with the biggest challenge that we face in the planet, the investor community is really ready to ramp up and is already doing so. Good, well here's to that. And what about your final message to an advocate, perhaps a new advocate, uh, tuning in today, just in terms of what you hope their next steps might be? Well, Ali, I think there's a, a great way where advocates can get involved, whether it's signing the climate commitments uh, pledge that we're all making, whether it's introducing startups to our startups uh, showcase, um, taking our survey. There's small steps that you can take. There are bigger steps that are, that are outlined in our climate commitment. So lots of individual ways for advocates to get involved. And if you're still looking for something, get in touch with me. Yeah, well, 
Thank you, and I know that they will take you up on that as well. Uh, Russ, just a personal thanks to you for being the renewable energy at the core of this ecosystem. So it's much appreciated. Thank you, Ollie. And Great to have I you channel with us. many, many people when I say that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, that does bring us to the end of our investor showcase, and I very much hope that our next event will be in person, or maybe even hybrid, who knows? And I look forward to seeing you and indeed all of the advocates again very, very soon. My renewed thanks to Russ, to Heeries, to all of our sponsors, and of course all of our speakers finally thank you to you for tuning in please share this broadcast far and wide let's keep spreading the word for now this has been the investor showcase 3.0 and until next time goodbye <laughs>